Yeah, let me know where we're live, guys. Yo, what up, everybody? Welcome to Ancient Visions with me, Gaz, and Ross from Planet X Films. Joining us today are Greg Fernandez and Dan Hennenen. And I just want to hand it over to everybody if you could start your intros for today. Yeah, if you guys want to set us off, Greg. Would probably help if I unmute myself and want to say <laughs> that would be <laughs> say tremendously hi. helpful. <laughs> hi to everybody. It's it's been one of one of those days. I can just say that there's so much happening, and I just think that this case is so relevant right right now. Um, there's there's a few things you could take out of this case, and uh, just you know, I think this will be. I hope this will be a good show. I haven't talked about. Um, the gray state script yet. So I, I don't, um, I'm, I'm sure looking forward it. to talking about this. I'm going to grab my notes here and um, I just hope everybody will uh, keep and just think about this case. Think about David Crowley. Think about what they are telling us. Think about um, all of the facts that show that David Crowley is not guilty and just keep an open mind. I'm going to open up my blinders here to get me a little more sunshine because we need that. First things first, Greg, can you let uh, everybody know where to find you, uh, your Gray Stage uh, recent book, uh, you guys' group, and just your channels, just whatever social media, best places for uh, people to find you guys. And we'll put them yeah, in the I link guess. as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess the best place would be to go to the the Gray Stage, uh, or go to, what is it, thegraystage.wordpress.com, and that will take you uh, to where you can um, either purchase the book or you can actually download that book free. And so it was very important for people. And Dan's got the book up now. But, um, you know, the main thing is this is all data based on all of the documents that we got based on photos, based on people that we personally talked to. Um, and so I just would, would hope that people will read this book and then you can you can come to your own conclusion about if you think David Crowley is guilty or not. But I do think that the biggest problem is that people just aren't looking at the facts of this case. They're going on feelings, and we can't do that with this. When we're talking about a, a former soldier who is um, being, who we're, we're told that he killed himself, he killed his wife, he killed his daughter, hands are missing, most of the heads are, are gone, his daughter's yeah. arm is completely gone, no way. There's definitely something more here. Absolutely. And uh, the man of the hour who pretty much pioneered a lot of the case research, Dan Hennen, please uh, let everybody know. Introduce Hello. yourself, let everyone know find well, it. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Hennen. I created the Justice for David Crowley and a family Facebook group that many of you are already on. I can also be reached on YouTube at DM Hennen or on my website at uglytruth.info. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. The, the Facebook page just went over 3,000 members here this uh, in the month of March. And so this has been five years running uh, that we've been running this page and this group. And it's never really hit a lull where it's been nothing going on. There's always been something going. There's been high spots and low spots. But uh, now I think since this coronavirus came out and everyone's been quarantined and told to stay at home and, and in lockdown, we can hardly keep up with the number of members coming through because I think people are watching that Netflix uh, movie called A Gray State, and yep. it's driving um, it's driving so many members to our to our page. So we're thankful for that. Uh, we don't endorse that documentary at all uh, as it is propaganda, but it's certainly the direct driver to driving people to our page and to our site. So we thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, I mean, there's there's so much to cover. I, I I mean, I'm not sure where you guys want to go directly in. I mean, I a gray state. I mean, it's been covered a few. You guys have kind of covered that a few times. So I mean, I really only think we need to gloss over that if people have specific questions. Uh, me personally, since I'm on the writing side, I wouldn't mind getting into the new script that uh, Dan recently released for us in the group. You guys can check that out under files. Uh, unless you have any anything that you have any questions for the guys, you want to start off with, guys. Certainly up to you guys. It's going to be free form, so. Yeah, it's pretty free flowing. Um, I just want to say to people as well, if they're watching now live on YouTube, you can drop your questions in the comments section. Um, bear in mind, my typing is really slow. Thanks to COVID-19, hand is severely cracked open with all the constant washing. But I can read your questions and pop them to the guys as well. But I think um, the writing side of things would be a great place to start. 
and I can answer the questions even though my answer might be gibberish. So uh, the yeah, no, I, I think I'm, I'm willing to get into this this screenplay because I have a lot of feedback on this, and I found it to be in a super un, unfinished form. Of now, you know, it's not uncommon for short films to go through twenty or thirty like completely full one hundred percent revisions. So, and we really don't know what uh, you know status this was. I mean. I guess, Dan, if you want to uh, start us off with any extra information you have on the two uh, the two revisions that you were able to obtain. So, so for the newer listeners out there that aren't familiar with it, The Gray State uh, was a project uh, with David Crowley and a group uh, of individuals that got together to work on a movie, an actual film. And so what they did was they didn't make a film, but instead produced a trailer, a two and a half minute trailer uh, that they released to the, to the internet on YouTube. And to this day, it has how many two, over two million views on that? Yeah, I think it's or, north of three. Last time I checked, over yeah, over three million. So it's done very good, very professionally, and it was out there. And then they were using that trailer to pitch for investors and, and pitching it to Hollywood producers to see who would pick up uh, on it and and fund them to be able to get it out there and get it into what they wanted to have it go uh, on the big screen. You know, have, have it be a uh, Hollywood movie well they never they got the they didn't get the funding and it was never made into a movie so um david crowley and his family were killed before that happened so the question was on our page most of the questions that come in as new members are saying um can you send us a link to the movie can you send a link to this well, we want to see the movie well greg and greg and i and others on the page the first thing we got to say is is to make sure that they understand that there is no movie they didn't never they never made the movie now, the Gray State Group made a documentary that was released uh, a couple of years after the deaths called Gray State, The Rise. Right. So they had a documentary called The Rise. And then and as a propaganda piece, the media came in and got some guys from Hollywood to make a documentary about this Gray State case, the David Crowley case. Mm -hmm. That's called A Gray State. And it's got nothing to do with, with us. Uh, Greg and I, we happen to be in it. Uh, for a couple of short sentences uh, in the documentary, but uh, it was pitched to us that they were going to really expose this case and blow the lid off what really happened in this documentary. Yeah, a big deep much, dive. Much like what I was expecting after seeing the movie Soaked in Bleach uh, right. about Tom Grant and the Kurt Cobain case, where there's so many movies and documentaries done on the Cobain case, and some are misinfo, some are disinfo, and finally this movie Soaked in Bleach came out on an actual documentary that got into the facts mm -hmm. that proved Kurt Cobain didn't kill himself. So when we got proposed, uh, you know, uh, approached to do this documentary uh, that was really going to really open things up, um, I, for one, jumped at the chance. Uh, Greg was more hesitant, thinking, you know, we might be being used and being thrown under, thrown under the bus on this whole case. And so ultimately, he was right because they did use right. us to, be, to focus on to discredit us as conspiracy theorists who don't know what we're doing. And they put in a bunch of cherry picked videos of David Crowley and his wife looking like nut jobs, uh, people who, who drank and, and did drugs and were in a domestic you know, violence relationship. They put all that together to paint David Crowley as a bad guy. So that's the documentary that's out there that's yeah the real deal from hollywood but great gray state has this uh documentary called the rise which is actually pretty good it's that's two and a half hours long but there is no gray state movie so people want to see the movie there was no movie it was never even made now they pitched it they pitched this uh information to a producer and to a a, a group that did purchase it and wanted to move forward with it as a web-based series but it didn't get any farther uh, right. the, the amount of that that was being tossed around was a $30 million deal to get this turned into something to make it into the uh, television homes uh, of the, uh, of the, to the public. And so we always thought, what's the chance of us getting that script? And the Gray State guys and us began clashing right away after we started exposing the anomalies in this, in this case. So we knew they weren't going to give it give it to us or even get it because I think right. that uh, some of the members wanted to take that script and move it into and, and pitch it to Hollywood producers to get it made into a film anyway. 
So we never we never heard about it. We never found anything. Now five years goes along, I get a notification from someone who wishes to remain anonymous to say, you know what, I have a copy of that script, and I'm like, I you know, about every couple of weeks I, I run across one of these instant messages where someone's got something. Yeah. Well, you're hesitant. You're hesitant, of course. And I said, okay, sounds yeah. good. Send it over. And so uh, I received it in the form of a PDF file, uh, 126 pages. And it said, Gray State script written by David Crowley in May of 2014. So I go through and read it. It looks legit to me. Uh, I'm not going to comment if I, if I like it or not or if it was well done or not. But it looked to me like a script and it was the content of what David Crowley was producing. So I released yeah, it I onto the justice page and, and say, here it is. Um, I'm not going to talk about it or summarize it. I just uploaded the file directly to our page. There's a section called files. If you go to our justice for David Crowley and family Facebook group and become a member there, you can see all the files. I uploaded it there. People were looking at it. People were reading it. People were giving comments and pros and cons and, you know, questionable things. And that was really, that was that. Now, a couple of weeks later, I get approached by the same anonymous person to say, here's another revision. Well, I'm like, oh, really? You know, seriously? Uh, are we going to get these now every two weeks? <laughs> said, okay, I'm not mad at it. <laughs> good. Send, send it over. It's in PDF format, 126 pages. It's simply called V6, version 6. Right. Now, this right. one doesn't have a name. doesn't have David Crowley's name. There's no title. The, con the, the, the content is roughly the same as it was before. There's some things that were changed and altered, but I'm like, okay, I'll upload this as well to the same group, to the same section, and people can read it and draw their own conclusions. Uh, it seems to me like it was David Crowley's script. Uh, was it in a finished version? Was it a preliminary version? Um, what happened to the five versions in between or the four? Yeah. You know, what, right. what, what's the deal? Some people read it. I think actually Greg uh, Fernandez Jr. who's on this call and said, I think that sounds to be more like a preliminary script than the other one. It doesn't sound like a, a normal right. version, but something right. else. Now right. here we are at the end of March. I haven't received anything back uh, from anything else. Uh, all I know is that there's two versions of the script out there. We have all been waiting for this script. Now we have it, and it, it's it's odd. There's nothing really in it that's explosive. Uh, I don't yeah. know if that was the version he would have been pitching either one of those versions to the producers for $30 million. Um, it was I really doubt it. <laughs> it was interesting nonetheless, but I liked all the banter that came about because it was out there now, and the members right. were able to at least – Put something together, get something to chew on. Yeah. Uh, the I only agree. blowback from releasing these, the first and the second script, is that Greg and I now have been getting a lot of, a uh, lot of, drawn a lot of flack. Uh, things have been kind of, we've been, things have been laying low for a while as mm -hmm. far as uh, threats and accusations and, and things directed our way and that kind of offensive uh, speak and messages like that. Well, now the script is out there and I've gotten not one, but two, but three, three or four strange things happening as far as instant messages, strange texts, mm -hmm. strange emails. Um, not, I wouldn't say threats, but people offend, highly offended that this is out there. So I don't know what's in the script that's explosive, but there must be something there that someone doesn't like because now it seems like we have stirred up a hornet's nest, if you will. That's all I've can got. You, I don't know what else to say. Can you identify any of the names from the messages you've been getting to anything that similar that you've gotten in the past, like anyone you've dealt with in the past? I know it you've got previous uh, messages. It, it, it is. Two of them were from people I have dealt with in the past, but I haven't heard from them in, I wouldn't say months, I would say years. Right. But now out of the blue, I get nasty messages right. from two of those individuals. The other two situations were people I did not know, and I still don't know who they even are. Right. But the timing right. is important here. It's the sure. timing because that's the only thing that we've been releasing other than Greg's book that came out at the end of last year. Uh, we haven't been getting hit with anything. 
Now the script right. is out there, and it seems to have rubbed someone the the wrong way. Some of these folks, and so I don't know why, but uh, but that's all I've got. I'm glad they're out there. I'm glad it's it's out there. It doesn't give me any more, I guess, uh, comfort. I mean, I read it, but it's. I think others in the group have done more uh, deep dive into that script than what right. I do uh, right. as far as uh, their backgrounds. What what strikes what strikes to me strange here and that is somebody who really you know is a fresh perspective of this doesn't really know anything about it is a complete noob is you know we see various films um tv series where we've got totalitarian governments take over suppression of civil liberties rights etc etc especially in sci-fi yeah so for me just coming from um outside of this whole area we're thinking well this you know apart from the case is it just another potential film with similar messages to some of them we've seen so it's i'm not discrediting anybody's work but you're getting a you know more or less messages that are kind of inferring stop what you're doing or stop going down this line when you know we've seen things like this as i said mentioned in other forms of film and media so that to me just comes across as quite strange already and you know and i don't really know anything about this just you know um do you have anything else on what dan said greg because yeah, yeah sure um there is a lot to cover there um and uh, when i read this script i thought this is one of the greatest scripts that i've ever read personally and i've read a lot of um scripts um, because I like writing scripts and it's tough. It's really tough to write a good script. So when I read this and I read the one, the first one um, that Dan got uh, the uh, May, I think it was, re- it has the date of May 12th. Yeah. May, May 12th, 2014. And I was, I was hooked. I was really hooked. And um, so I really enjoyed the, that script. When I read version six, it felt like a rough draft. And of course, I, I don't know, you know, and, and we don't know which one came first. And I can only I can only speculate, but I do feel like version six came first. And I do think that the draft from from May 12, 2014, I do think that that draft is what got David um, this 30 million dollar deal, because that's right around the time. I think it was maybe another a week after that or something. So uh, whatever he wrote in that one, I think that's the one that got his foot into the door. Now, we know around September of 2014, that became a TV series. So I don't know what the hesitation was. But looking at it more, I'm kind of feeling like the script is a prequel to the TV series, because if, if you read it and I don't, I don't know if we want to spoil it or how deep you guys really want to go in into it, but, um, you know, it leaves the, the door open for a TV series. That's the way that I felt like if you look at that last, the last couple scenes, and I know they're very difficult because there's a lot of jumping around and stuff, but, um, to me, it looks like that is setting up what the, the TV series will be is the whole country, at at war at civil uh, yeah the whole country is involved in a civil civil war by the end of it and the the what's crazy is the film starts that way too so it's right. just like you're kind of hoping things are going to get better and yeah, nope but there you, is hope take a guess that won't. <laughs> right <laughs> for right. sure and yeah. those, those, some of the um some of the other things that i liked about the script was his fighting scenes. I thought some of those fighting scenes, I could actually visualize it. And so um, I was looking forward to, um, you know, I, I obviously love martial arts movies, so I, I wanted more and more and more fighting scenes, but I could sure. visualize those fighting scenes. And I think they would have been really, really good. Um, the most interesting thing about this script is the fact that Danny Mason's character was taken out. The name for Danny Mason's character is John Wink, W-Y-N-C-K, something like Wink, whatever, John Wink, come on, we, mm-hmm. we all, whatever. So, but that character is not in this script. That character is completely taken out, and I believe um, the main character's name is Daniel Walker. So mm-hmm. it's changed, so, you know, one theory is that it was changed. Whatever it is, 
we know that um, David and Danny were working on a, um, you know, da David was trying to get Danny Mason to sign off his rights. And David was telling him that he would still have rights to the, to the character John Wink. Nothing is mentioned about this Daniel, this Daniel Walker. And this is in May of 2014. So it makes sense to me why the guys that David was talking about, the two Mikes, um, it makes sense now why they did not know who Danny Mason was. They had no idea that Danny Mason was ever even part of this whole project because by, by right. May, it looks like by May of 2014, Danny Mason's out. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I would agree, yeah, that, 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 that is the way things look behind the scenes. Um, I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning because Dan uh, unpacked so much there. So because this, these are all like common misconceptions that people get with the gray state feature film narrative that, you know, the screenplay David wrote versus the concept trailer versus the a gray state mess that just cap tried to capitalize on the situation versus the gray state, the rise, because uh, if we, I'm going to, I'm going to go. So, so the concept trailer drops first and, um, that's what they used to run the uh, the Indiegogo campaign that they were using for crowdfunding, which is how I got involved. They got $60,000 for that, and that was supposed to be used for resources to help write the script and get it ready to pitch it to the, uh, you know, pitch it to a studio to, to pick up the feature film, which is what Dan was referring to earlier. Uh, in that time, David was working on the Great State, The Rise documentary, which was supposed to cover the kind of background subject matter, which is the documentary of the topics that was the material Gray State, the feature film was going to use. So it's like, that's why so many people confuse this with like, I see a lot of people go on the group and they go, I saw Gray State. And it's like, no, you saw a Gray State. And then, or they go on YouTube and they go, where's the movie? I want to watch the movie. I'm like, yeah, I want to watch the movie too. You know what I mean? And as Dan says, you know, it didn't really ever get to that point. They had, you know, possibly a uh, early or late level screenplay that was, you know, being used to pitch to Hollywood or wherever. I suppose now the big thing would have been, you know, streaming services such as, you know, Netflix having its own studio, uh, Amazon Prime and the like and all of them picking up stuff. But <clears throat> one thing I want to say about the um, Grey State, The Rise is when we had this this infighting that I told you guys about when I saw uh, the comments. See, I, I, I'm more active on like Twitter than anything else. But a lot of those pages have their Facebook linked to their Twitter. So when Gray State The Rise started uh, posting slandering uh, uh, Danny August Mason, um, it was actually Sean Wright, I believe, is the one who has had the admin rights to that page. And I guess he was doing, you know, what was left of, of the Gray State The Rise stuff. Now, the, after David's passing, this... Uh, unfinished version of gray state the rise leaks all over youtube it's like three hours long and it has like these unfinished portions of it where it says like insert something here blah 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 and later on that starts getting flagged and and taken down you know um it gets removed and then ultimately they remove the gray state from it it comes out um it's like two hours long they chop a bunch of david's stuff out of it and it's just called the rise they totally drop the gray state from it um and they also mostly removed Danny August Mason from the documentary, which, uh, you know, uh, had a lot of shots of uh, his material, the concept trailer material they used, as well as a bunch of, uh, you know, extra, you know, extraneous uh, footage that they were using for the Gray State channel uh, at the time when they were doing the promotion campaign. So that's there's just a whole bunch of strange things there that are totally inconsistent as far as guys arguing with each other across uh, Facebook and then, you know, chopping the documentary and kind of putting out this abomination that has like, like really bad uh, sound mixing. Um, so at that point, that's the trailer and the documentary. Then the A Gray State uh, documentary hits Netflix, which I suppose is where most people watch it. And it kind of has you guys segments in there. And, you know, they kind of put you guys in as, you know, like, they, you know, they totally tried to try to just write you guys off. And it's like, it's hilarious. They tried to get you guys to say something that they really couldn't get you to say, you know what I mean? Which is like, you guys believe the government did it, right? And you guys were like, no, <laughs> like, we're just kind of, we're looking into the case. You know what I mean? It's like, we just want answers. You know what I mean? Which is kind of funny. They're like, you know, yeah. Cause there's people on the internet that believe stuff like these guys, you know what I mean? It's like, yet you go into the rest of the documentary. It really doesn't have any facts or, you know, probably the weirdest part about it for me is like the whole uh, pact 
pack theory where you have these mentions of this pack theory, but there's just really not anything to, to back that up, that there's any evidence of it, like other than like, yeah, a couple of people heard there was a pact. Okay. So and then, and then it just goes straight on. So there was a pact. What? They just totally gloss over it. You know what I mean? Like there's absolutely no evidence like that's That's just super strange about it. So, I mean, that pretty much gets us to here with the concept trailer, the uh, rise, the a gray state. And then finally Dan, you know, gets a copy of this, uh, this, this feature film screenplay. So um, that's, that's pretty much, much where we're at now, I guess, you know, with, with, with all this stuff. And uh, also, you know, now we have uh, Dan's uh, book, I mean, excuse me, Greg's book, uh, the gray state, which I think, you know, has some really awesome material in it as well. Very, uh, very informative. So everybody go check that out. Um, that's, I, I think that's one of the best, uh, kind of timeline followings of all the information in one place. Um, aside from the updates that of the video updates that Dan has done on his channel, which you've pretty much been doing those for years, Dan, with <laughs> pretty much the big deep dive of, of all the way in on the info. So I'd say those are the two main places to find information on the case, but yeah, that's the that's the difficulty with this case is you're talking about like five projects with all these shady characters and no one agrees with each other and no one gets along. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I would say without a doubt. And and after that split with Sean Wright and Danny August Mason, Danny August Mason uh, moves out down to down to Austin, so he's he's out from where they were shooting all that stuff um, as well. So it's like it almost seems like for sure that there was a split there. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, the other thing I want to bring up is when Danny came on the group drunk and he was supposed to debate you or, or whatever happened, uh, Greg, like that's something I would have really have, have liked to see because, you know, nobody from this Gray State crew. I mean, they did like what Mason did that one pod, podcast and a couple of people did things here or there, but nobody, you know, they did like a couple interviews after David. But again, no one ever really ever answered any questions. And that's like that's kind of another huge problem with it is you have these people kind of trolling Greg and Dan online in their, in their Facebook messenger, but no one wants to come out front and face the fire. You know what I mean? So that's another huge, huge problem I have with it. So yeah, I don't know. Definitely. Kind of rambled there, but I don't know if you guys have anything on that. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I got a couple things. Uh, you brought up a good point. Uh, part of the confusion, I think, uh, with the name was the Netflix or at the time uh, it was, I think, broadcast originally on A&E indie films. Um, I think yep. they named it a gray state on purpose as part of this property to cause additional chaos and confusion. They could have called it the, uh, the, the David Crowley, uh, you know, murder nut job case. You know, they could have called right. it something else, but they right. chose to call it something very similar. And it's added, it was added that way on purpose as propaganda to cause more confusion. And so, I agree. I totally agree. I, I, Good point. I, I think what happened there. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. I think what happened there was this. Um, they found out about the concept trailer. Everyone found out that it made 60,000 plus and I think it was like 65 in, uh, in crowdfunding. They found out that the feature script was never leaked at the time or that the project was never completed, albeit a feature narrative film or a se like series. you know that part? That part doesn't matter. So there was this huge, they found out that the, the gray state Facebook, didn't they have like 60,000 like subscribers or likes or followers, whatever they had this huge following there. So they found out there was this huge following that crowdfunded a, a concept trailer into a lot of money of a concept trailer that got 3 million views, like Dan was saying, but also that the feature film never came out. So there was this huge void of a fan base here. And, you know, that was like a, like Dan said, a kind of promotional executive uh, decision. Uh, oh, th this project never came out. Well, we can name our documentary <laughs> Grace, a gray state. And that fills the void right there. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like a unfilled, you know, correct. And, uh, it was to cause confusion. And the, before that documentary came out, uh, there was a big piece done in, in a, a feature piece in the New Yorker magazine that came out uh, several months before Alec Wilkinson, uh, did that, uh, article and it was, yep. I read through that and I'm like, well, that's, uh, that was also pure propaganda. It was, they were just pushing a narrative to get it out there. But once we found yeah. out by the time that article went to press and was published and went out, went out into that New Yorker magazine, it was about the same time that the, a gray state documentary 
was going out and making the right. rounds on the Tribeca Film Festival. All these, the Melbourne, the Sydney, Australia Film Festival. The yep. film festivals, they entered it in the UK, all over Europe, and all over the United States and Canada. And then that came out in November, the actual movie, right. November of uh, actually December, around Christmas Day of 2017. And once you see the documentary, it ties in so perfect to that article that was written. Yeah. It was yeah. what I call a companion piece of propaganda. Right. Right. Uh, Propaganda piece A and propaganda piece piece B that are meant to go together as a thing uh, as a oper operation to fool the public is all that it was meant to do, and so now you start asking your questions: Why was the New Yorker involved with writing propaganda, and why is a Eric Nelson in L.A. Hollywood, um, you know, propped up to to go and make a documentary? with this narrative that all lines up together with David being a crazy person, which means someone in high places and with lots of money was able to steer this event or steer this propaganda. This is afterwards now. I'm not talking that there's people in high places that called out the killing or the government did the killing, but the blowback and the aftermath of this family's triple homicide. And it involves a five-year-old girl and his 28-year-old wife who had nothing to do with anything. Uh, so, right. so this is, it takes away all the, the focus on what really happened, the horrible, horrible things that happened in that home, right. to blaming it on that David and his wife were, uh, were strange and um, were, were just an odd couple, not doing well financially, dire straits, and he decides to kill them, kill the family. Well, we already know that's not true, but you've got to ask yourself, why was the propaganda introduced in the format of a high, uh, highly visible subscription New Yorker magazine and a big right. movie uh, called A Gray State with the guy who, who did the, the Grizzly Man uh, and right. uh, by right. Werner, Werner Herzog. Uh, this guy goes right. way back. So you right. gotta ask why were these people put in place to do this? And not only was it just a documentary that was went out on A&E and then ended up on Netflix, but they, um, they entered themselves, they entered this film into all of these award categories for the Oscars that year. Best documentary, best original, all, all of these things that they, they wanted to really pump this thing up big and push it out there. And that takes funding to do that as right. well. They, they entered all of these different categories to win. Nothing came of it, and it ended up being a backfire. Right. But that was the intent. Was to compete to, is to get as many people of the common uh, general public to believe this narrative, and at the same time shut down people like me and Greg and others who are honestly just looking into questions because uh, as, as an attempt to discredit us. So that to me is very telling when you put out something like that to do that. Now I, I like to thank them at the same time because most people who watch that documentary, who are critical thinkers and understand the big picture and how things really work, leave that movie when it ends, um, thinking something's not right. Something's That's what something, I thought. Yeah. A myth. Yeah. something doesn't add up. The dots don't connect. It, it's kind of yeah. jumbled the way it's set up and it doesn't really make sense. And we're seeing such a big influx on uh, new members on our page, I think because of this coronavirus uh, COVID-19 outbreak and everyone's locked up at home and we can't keep up with the new membership coming into the group and people right. watching this because uh, they've got nothing else to do. So we thank them all for that. Yeah. What's our numbers at, Dan? What What are the numbers at right now? Do well, you know? just today I looked I looked that up. We, we crossed over the 3,000 membership uh, here nice. in the month of March, which is pr pretty big for – I manage seven or eight different pages on Facebook that have wow. two or 300 people on some of these groups, but nothing as big as 3,000. Um, but uh, we did see a 6% increase in the last two months, and we added 272 new members in the last 60 days. That's crazy. Um, and of those members, 1,800 of those 3,000 members actually show as active in the past 60 days as well. They're not, they're yes. actually, they're reading, looking at things, watching, commenting, and responding, and liking things. They're not just dormant members that don't take any action. They're very active in our group. I have found that 65% of our members are women, 35 are men. So it's really drawing in mm -hmm. a lot of females into this case. They're really drawn into this, uh, this, this true crime nature 
of it. And the age group between 25 and 54 years old is 78% of our membership is that group. Not a lot of young folks, not a lot of older folks, but the right in the middle, the 25 to 54 is 78%. And we're getting countries by the demographic breakdown. Number one is the United States, of course, but number two is the UK. Then we get Canada, Australia is number four, Germany, yes. Mexico, France, Italy, Pakistan, and India. These are the top 10 countries, uh, but it goes down. There's over 100 countries listed that make up our 3,000 members. It's a, it's, a, it's a wide array. It's a very diverse group of people. Now in the U.S., the top 10 cities, as far as our membership breakdown, Minneapolis, New York City is number two. Nice. San Antonio is three. Hmm. Los Angeles, Houston. Number six is St. Paul, Minnesota. Number seven comes in as cities, not even in the U.S., uh, is Sydney, Australia, is the seventh largest city of our membership. A lot of people down under are following this case down in Sydney. Then it goes to Chicago. Then number nine is London. London and then Philadelphia, Pennsylvania rounds out the top ten for biggest cities. But the, the membership is just its phenomenal. And we have such good, good people as well. Uh, they're honest. Uh, honest to goodness, people looking for uh, the truth. Many of them have contacted me directly saying I've had a, a loved one commit suicide or have had a loved one that uh, was killed or I've had a loved one that is in a situation like that and or has been discredited or is a whistleblower. And so you get a lot of people that um, have empathy. I think it's the biggest thing of our memberships is, is they have the empath, empathy background and uh, we're going after these people which oddly enough, the men and the folks that are in the Gray State Project are, are comprised mainly of, of individuals with no empathy and no conscience. Yeah, I could probably go down that road as well. Yeah, definitely. I think what a lot of people want is what I probably picked up just from watching it, as you said, is you've got this case of a loving family and it just doesn't seem to correlate, make any sense. As I said earlier, you know, when we were talking before we went live, it feels like there's a whole part of this story missing. And, you know, you guys are, are simply just asking some questions saying, look, what's happened? You're not um, saying, right, we think this person's done it or, or anything like that. Um, and it's just, like you, like you said, when people watch this documentary on Netflix, like I did, I think I had a migraine after watching it. I was just so confused. I just thought, <laughs> I still can't make sense of this. What has yeah. happened? And that's me coming from a totally new newbie perspective. And you're totally right, Dan. Um, anyone watching that, if they can empathize and say, look, here's very loving family, and it's, it's very tragic what's happened. So what is these... Um, but missing missing information that 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 is out there that doesn't seem to to back up um, you know those loving people that we saw on screen. So yeah, hundred percent agree. The other thing, um, uh, Greg, and you might get this as well. But the the people that uh, I talk to that communicate to me or or are happy and enthusiastic about joining the group is the number one comment is that they always seem to say, you know what, I'm absorbed, I'm consumed by this case. I've gone just six hours of watching videos. I've just finished, you know, 11 hours of uh, watching YouTube videos on this case. Uh, and I can't get it up. I can't, I just can't stop. So they, what they do is they become almost obsessed with the case because it's so intriguing. And that's what, what I'm seeing a lot of is, is the new members. And they're coming in from all over, all, all cities, all countries. There's an interest. But right now, I think because of the coronavirus and the various lockdowns of all these different countries, I think people are stumbling upon that as a, you know, maybe a recommended movie to watch or something on Netflix. They may not know anything about it, and they're jumping on. I also see we're getting a lot of locals. I myself am in Minnesota, and we're getting a lot more people in the state, uh, I think, and in the area that hadn't even known this case existed. I mean, this is a triple homicide that was horrendous back in 2015, and because of the lack of media coverage on the case, uh, a lot of people just didn't hear about it, and we're getting those now. Um, these current numbers uh, you're seeing, is, is this your fastest growing rate ever? Uh, other than starting off uh, when, the, when we started the page was huge. Mm -hmm. And then once that the original 
police report came out, Greg, I think it was January of 2016. Uh, January of 2016, Apple Valley Police Department concluded their investigation. And there was some pieces done in the local media, uh, articles, uh, People Magazine, and a lot of nationwide art articles did a summary basically confirming the fact that David did this allegedly. We had a huge influx of new members at that time. And then I think once the documentary came out, that was the other time we hit a, a peak. Yeah. But nothing like this. This is, this is, uh, it's tough to keep up with all the uh, the new members. It's, it's exciting. Um, we got we got to get Greg back in here soon because he's been out for a little bit. But I because Dan covered so much when when he was talking before. I want to just go back to the uh, publications and the, and the hit piece of the kind of propaganda pieces that came out at the time. The other thing Dan pointed out were these kind of obviously fake film reviews that popped up on Rotten Tomatoes and all these other things that were like 100% ratings, like it's the best thing I've ever seen. Like the, it wasn't even out yet. Three people had been at like three film festivals, like, and they kind of just started popping up instantly. I found that to be like, uh, super <laughs> fabricated, super fabricated response. And also the whole Robot. circus of the <laughs> right the whole circus of the a gray state docu uh, documentary you know it as dan was saying it it roman it romanticizes their pact and it becomes more about this you know kind of seemingly false domestic violence narrative and how how david was this tyrant um and it, it just creates a circus out of the whole story and you start to forget that this is a real family you know like greg was saying and his, you know that's the main focus of his book uh you know the project david was working on it it, it kind of glosses over that too like not that okay you know he had this big meeting with the, with these hollywood producers but more like uh uh oh and david was working on this uh a gray state uh screenplay and uh it was about conspiracies and and yeah, he was looking into some dark stuff, so he snapped. But anyway, and then it, you know, again, it glosses over it and jumps back into this. What are, what are we talking about? So I just, I find it completely inconsistent and completely incoherent. Um, but Greg, do you have anything on uh, any of these recent points? We, I think, I think that's a great way to say it. it that's that's exactly it. You know, it it jumps around purposely yeah. because it it knows it's it's just trying to hit beats and it's trying to hit beats to touch people to get them to not look any further. That is their whole point. Well, this guy is crazy. Oh man, you know, okay, yeah. well, he's, he's not so so. Of course, he did it. Well, his his script was was going bad. The deal was was dead. I don't know if they really covered that the deal was dead but then they show i think the they two, basically insinuate it you know they like, basically do and and they show you know that the two mics their reason why they passed on it they try to they try to just build all of those different things but it's really right. what, what we don't see in that film is the most important thing there is a reason why kamel's family was taken out they uh -huh, wanted yes. all of their stuff taken out they did not want yes. to be part of this project Yep. And that's a big, big deal because I wonder if David's side, if there's people on David's side that also feel that same way too. So right. that was that was a big thing. But yeah, the whole the whole pack theory, the whole pack thing, and they're still promoting that. People are still trying to convince people that yeah. they're a pack theory. It's you, crazy. You know what? I want to bring up something unrelated, but at the same time similar. Uh, this whole I, I'm familiar with another documentary that that attempts to push a packed pack theory out of New England. There was this thing about the the Gloucester 18 with these high school girls that were supposedly cr created a pregnancy pack for all of them to get uh, pregnant, like young girls in high school or whatever. And there's like multiple documentaries and projects made about this. It's just this random article popped up, almost a similar situation as far as random articles popping up and then these weird documentaries blowing up about it. And it ends up being the same situation where a lot of it was just publicized and, and there may have never been any pact at all. So there's something about, you know, when when there's not much clear cut material for them to just put put their story out and stick to it. It's like the pact is like uh, it's like a, almost like a scapegoat. You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, we don't have much. So it was a pact. And then they throw it out there and you're just you're supposed to go with. OK, well, you know, none of the evidence points directly to David. So. Let's go with the packed thing. Think you know, I, mean, I feel like it's like the throw it, the throw it out of the throw it out in the trash. It was a packed, like, huh? Like again, there's, there's just nothing that sticks to it. 
Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still su surprised they didn't uh, stumble upon a big giant manifesto written by David Crowley <laughs> or something. And Dude, had a lot. I'm, I'm that's, sure it's that's coming. That's the other one, right? <laughs> yeah. you've, still got, you've still got revisions rolling in, so there's plenty of someone's working on it right now. Come in there. Uh, manifesto <laughs> by David Crowley, version seven. You know I'm I mean? sure they. I'm sure people people tried. I'm sure they tried, but uh, they tried. A lot of different things but um it is really about how the common person watches that film so gaz yeah. you you didn't know that much about this project you didn't know that much about well, david when you watched this movie well we we actually did interview david back That's on our right. old audio stream it, i thought i recognized your gaz your, is my oh, original yeah. co-host yeah. from our okay. original audio I show we it, used to do we yeah. had yeah. like a basically cross genre you know him out of the punk scene and me out of the hip-hop yeah. scene and we used to do films and other things that we were interested in, but Gaz was familiar with the concept trailer and what the project was to yeah. me. But I don't, I don't think he followed and the actual yeah, case. I, as I much. reached out oh. to David and and Danny. I spoke. We exchanged a couple of emails, and you know, we did the interview with David, and it was generally going over the pitch concept with the film and everything, and then a bit of a general right. chit chat. I think we maybe discussed his career in a military, and since then, um, no, I haven't followed followed it at all i heard about you know the the tragedy tragedy obviously was shocked because i was like wow that's a guy who's been on our show and actually oh, right. we had um another guest from the punk scene who um committed suicide as um totally different case and circumstances not you know nothing suspicious around that one but it, it certainly shocks you because you're like hey you know we we've, we talked to this guy so right. Um, what I can we talked to David twice, yeah. Gaz. You you set up a preliminary call where oh, we yes. all spoke oh, to get sorry, to know each other. Right. Then oh, we did the real show. So yeah, yeah, that's Gaz right. set up both those both. Yeah, those and, and what and what struck and like uh -huh. as I've, I've mentioned a few times, it when I watched that documentary on Netflix, when I've looked up the various sites, tried to read other reviews and articles, and you know, there's a lot of what we see now online of people just attacking each other. Like, would somebody just read this? Because to me, who doesn't know anything about it this this seems really funny and suspicious like i've mentioned there's just more to it um and you, you know you guys are just wanting to try and uncover what that mystery is that's right yeah absolutely um going to what you were saying greg uh about about sidra i want to uh I do want to get to the script because that was, that was kind of be my main focus. But obviously, yeah. when you're dealing with a book, five different projects, Dan's 10 years of research, it's not quite easy to just pull up the Rolodex <laughs> and rip from, <laughs> rip from topic to topic. Yeah, here we go. You know, it's like Rolodex. JFK or any other big, you know what I mean? It's not just the easiest thing to cover one call. Which rolls is up, Dan has an entire channel for it. Greg has an entire channel for it. Another Gray Stage page. It's, you know. The, the best way to follow the cases is, is along with those resources. But um, going to uh, the resource of, of Greg's book, when you when you spoke with uh, Sidra Greg, I believe that was over the phone or uh, how, however you chronicled it in your book. But basically what she says of like, it's never, uh, it's never, the project is never getting uh, done without the uh, uh, permission of, of Sidra's father. And I, I guess, that's interesting because I, 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 so does that mean he got a stake in the, in the actual uh, intellectual property? Because was it our understanding that with, if David copyrighted it with him gone, it, we, we thought that the rights would go to Dan Crowley senior. Was it, was, was that the way things went? Cause I wasn't, I wasn't sure that. I'll probably let Dan uh, take that one. I think he's, he probably knows more about well, I think all, from of, the all of that. From the from the business standpoint, it, the script was owned by, I think it was Hot Head Productions or the movie, uh, and so that David right. probably owned that himself. One hundred percent was was Hot Head Productions, and so that was his business. That was his movie. That was his script. Now we know Danny August Mason was a co-founder and co-creator of the whole thing, but I don't know if he had any uh, in a stake in that ownership at, at all. And so the script itself, once the once David died, uh, murdered, you know, uh, you got to go through the chain of the the remaining heirs of who gets the rights to that. Now, and I would say that that script was probably the biggest asset that that, that David Crowley had. He lived in an average home and drove average cars and didn't have a wealth of other things. And right. so when people say you, you need uh, proof for means 
motive and opportunity to kill someone, um, there wasn't really that much for David except for that script. And, and right. so that was valued at roughly $30 million. And so this is how we get into the fact that if someone didn't want David around, they would have taken out David. But there's a reason, in my mind, my opinion, that his wife was taken out and his child, there only had one child, was little Rania, was five-year-old girl. All of them had to be taken out for that script or that asset of $30 million, potentially, to land in the, either the family's lap of the Crowleys, which was David's parents who were divorced, which is his parents, his father was Dan Sr. And his, and his mother was Kate, or it was right. land into the Alam family who was Comel, David's wife. Um, his parents were married, uh, was Nyla and Anjum were the parents. And so your question right. is, would it land into their lap or would it land into the Crowley lap? That's my question as well. It should go 50-50 to each. And I think the Crowley family assumed it was going to fall into their lap. And I think that's why the people that benefited from the killing, if you want to go that route uh, from a detective standpoint, who benefits from having these three people dead? It would be, in this case, Dan Crowley, senior, the father, Kate, the mother, and the kids, which is Dan Jr. and his sister, Allison. Now, seven months later, Dan's David Crowley's mother, Kate, who's divorced, passes away, dies strangely enough under strange circumstances. Her body is found dead outside of her house, also in Minnesota, uh, in the same city as where the, uh, the dad or the ex-husband was living. And her body was found out on the backyard patio, slumped over a table on her uh, on table outside. And so they came and looked for her. The boyfriend, the person she was dating, didn't. Uh, she wasn't returning any calls uh, that night. Went and did a welfare check, called authorities, and they found her body there dead. Now she was only 51 years old, uh, healthy, and had two jobs. Um, but maybe she just did die accidentally. To me, that raises too many red flags because of Dan Jr., right. the brother who David was not getting along with and had severed ties. They weren't speaking, had something to gain and possibly was involved in the killing or the commission of this crime. He may be involved. Um, and so the dad is Dan Crowley senior um, who was quick to grab a hold of that script or take the company to the next level to, to, to buddy up with Danny August Mason and create this new company called Gray State Universe LLC. Yeah, which was put that. in to creation in the month of May, along with the appropriate uh, trademark and copyright information from a business standpoint. They were the two that wanted to take this script and run with it, not to get another $30 million to go to big budget uh, Hollywood producers to make it, but maybe they were going to pitch it to some midsize and make uh, $15 million off it or something smaller. Yeah, go to the streaming services or something so, instead of a theater they release. They took an active role on taking that next step, as were found by the evidence that we found used going back to the uh, Secretary of Minnesota, Secretary of State, Minnesota. We found that the, the company was formed. We found that Danny August Mason did hire a lawyer to get it trademarked, uh, to get the logo of the gray state done, and mm -hmm. incorporate some of the intellectual property for that. So... We've got evidence to suggest that he was moving forward with this case. Mm -hmm. And so nothing was said about the alarms at all. And so I think that they, push comes to shove, should have 50% rights to that script or any asset that David had because sure. David was married to uh, Comel. And in the state of Minnesota, you are now one one unit. Uh, you're not 5149 right. ownership. It's 50-50. So the next heirs or the kin, next of kin, would be 50-50 for that script should go to the Alam family and the Crowley family even. And then have a judge or something divvy it up from there. But it was at that point that the Crowleys never communicated to the Alams after that point. There was no communication. Right. 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 They started having issues with that script. Uh, as far as who was going to take that business and run with it, Crowley's took it, basically assuming it was theirs, and right. started running with it, and then never returned any phone calls back to the Alam family. And hmm. so that's where you get we start putting the pieces together of what was going on here in the mindset of these individuals. Right now, Danny August Mason, all he had to do was sign off on his legal rights 
uh, that David rec recommended back in August of the year before uh, the family was killed. Uh, he just wanted him to write him out as he did in the script. But Greg said in the May script of May 2014, had already written Danny Magus Mason on August Mason out of the script. Right. And so when he's working with the producers and the executive, uh, uh, the executives uh, in Hollywood, they already knew they were going to go with a different main actor. They didn't want to have Danny August Mason, uh, right. which I think they didn't want him out there either. So he, he was done. He was, he was, his days were numbered being in the gray state. So there's your motive now, once again, and he says, I need you to fill out this legal paperwork so you can't come back later and claim you have rights to this movie or the script. Danny August Mason refused to sign that legal document. Yeah, he was stalling. He, he, he responded he, back, but he was stalling. He was given the uh, paperwork in August, uh, reminded to sign it in September, reminded in October, reminded in November, and finally, mid-December, David Crowley says, I'm giving you a deadline of December 16th. You either need to shit or get off the pot on this thing. You need to do something. You need to take an action. Uh, I'm moving forward without you, or we got to come up with something. So you need an answer by the 16th. Well, two weeks later, the bodies were found. Uh, well, around Christmas, they alleged that the bodies were killed. And so there never was an answer from Danny August Mason. Right. Or signing off those rights. So I think in his mind, because he didn't sign off on the legal paperwork, he was still owed something, whether royalties, whether it's uh, right. business yeah. percentage of the business or something. Ownership, yeah, exactly, equity. He still fought that. So I think that leads back to your means, motive, and opportunity for this whole thing. Uh, Sean Wright was already out of the picture, David's other good friend, and uh, he had switched his phone number, David did, and in fact didn't even give it to Sean Wright. And, and uh, we see that from a Facebook post when, when uh, David was going to release the rise, that documentary, just himself is going right. to release it actually for free. And that's and when that's Sean when, Wright that's when attempted Sean Wright to control the rise. You, you know can't do I mean? that thing called the rise. And that's got my tax stuff in there that could send me yeah. to prison because he was yeah. facing charges that he later pled guilty to in the state of Minnesota for tax evasion. Right. And so he was facing a lot of things. And then in one of his posts, Sean Wright says, David, here's my phone number. You've got to give me a call. Call me. We, let's, let's work this out. So David had already cut off ties from Sean. He was in the process of cutting off the ties right. from Danny August Mason. And then right. the bodies were found dead. And the police detective's first inkling should be to go to these two individuals. Yeah, I, I agree with that. With, with these people. As as simply persons of interest, uh, they have the most. They were the ones that had issues with it. They were the ones had a falling out. They were the ones not pursuing any. Uh, they wouldn't have been part of any of this thirty million dollar project. Right. And his own brother, who he had a falling out with in August, wasn't even speaking to him. David. Right. So those and would be the probably the three first people I would, as a detective, start interviewing, and they never sure. did. That. For sure. And not only that, it gets better when they uh, question Danny August Mason. Where, did you have any ownership in the project? He says no. And then he says he was just an actor. So it's, but and we Rob, never heard that any other Rob time except right. when he spoke to the police. Yeah. You know I mean, right. to everyone else, it was like I'm VP of the, you know, thing. So, um, yeah, Ross, that's a good point. For a lot of the newer members here that aren't familiar with that, Ross is right on the money. He was questioned by police to say, what was your stake? What was your connection to David Crowley and this script and or this movie? He said, I was nothing, merely an actor. I had no connection from a business standpoint right. in this film. So that was an outright lie right there to the detectives. But like you said, he packed up and moved to Austin, Texas shortly thereafter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to get Greg in here once again. I just want to shout out a couple people. Shout out to Sophia. She's uh, she's with us in the, in the chat. And then also shout out to my man, Mike O'Day. Uh, he's a very talented uh, Boston area actor. Uh, he does Irish crime films and he was in The Equalizer with Denzel Washington. Mike, uh, Mike has helped me with some of my own screenplay writing and things of that nature. Very talented writer. Uh, Mike was just wanted a breakdown of, you know, kind of the last few things that we covered. So basically, Mike, Greg and Dan are in this documentary called A Gray State, which covers the murder of David, well, the death of David Crowley, I will say, uh, the questionable death of David Crowley, which was uh, suppo a supposed murder-suicide of his family. 
David uh, did the Gray State concept trailer, which I think I sent you, Mike. Uh, it was on YouTube. It has three million views. It's a pre-apocalyptic, just dystopian, totalitarian, uh, martial law kind of thing, rather similar to what's going on now. And um, David David passes away uh, several years ago when he was pitching this feature film narrative screenplay to uh, to a Hollywood uh, producer uh, production company. And uh, basically, after that happens. There's some fighting with the former crew that he was working with before, uh, infighting, and kind of uh, possibly struggle to get the rights to his project, which is ultimately <clears throat> never made to this day. Uh, recently, somebody emailed the uh, a, a copy revision of the possibly uh, working title screenplay to Dan, who posted it in their Justice for David Crowley uh, group. So that's uh, <clears throat> that's kind of what's going on right now and what we're covering right now um do you have anything else on, on any of the stuff any of these points greg um no i would actually love to hear what mike thinks of of the script if and when he gets a chance to um to read it but um basically yeah you just have you you have a guy who was um he was uh, accused of a double murder su suicide and we can't find any evidence that he's guilty Yet we have all these people, including the investigators, that keep telling us that he is guilty. There's nothing to look at here. These aren't the droids that we're looking for to go yeah. home. Don't worry about it. Life is good. Why do you care? Why do you care uh, about this, this case? And it's like, well, why don't you guys care? Why don't you care enough to investigate this as investigators? That's what they're getting paid for. They're not yeah. getting paid to, to come up with their own theories and then go with those theories within 24 hours. Within four to 24 hours, these investigators are telling us David Crowley is guilty. Family and friends and great state team members are telling us that David Crowley is guilty. And all right. we've ever asked for was evidence. That, I wrote a book, that, 200 yeah. pages. There's no evidence. There's no evidence that David Crowley is guilty. And that's based on thousands of pages of documents. Right. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's the thing right there is like the whole the whole thing of the so Kurt Cobain is soaked in bleaches about the thing is showing up to the scene and like, well, there's a couple of bodies there and there's a gun by the body, but it's not by his gun hand looks like you know that, that that's the whole thing it's like it, you know when they wiped down the rifle on the soaked in bleach case and they you know and they walked in and like well there's a it's just a guy with a body and a shotgun and there's some heroin neatly put away in his heroin box looks like a suicide to me it was like that's the whole thing that was so soaked in bleach just about this thing and also there's a bunch of other things i want to get to but real quick dan i want to totally commend you for the hiring of the private investigator to look into the case uh I wish we would have gotten a lot more out of Kenneth Maines. I was really looking forward to those results and how he praised the AVPD for what a good job they did. I, 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 I totally commend you for doing that. I really think it would have been good to go with someone that was, that was, and I, I don't know how many of private investigators exist that aren't former police. Cause I know it's probably like 60 or 70% of them that are former detectives, which I understand because it's a very similar skill set. But man, dude, he drank the Kool-Aid so hard on that report, man, that I, I I couldn't do it, man. Like I was just like, man, missing even the even the gray state guys, we all know what we think of them. We're ripping on them for the, the, the freaking hole in the, the ceiling, you know what I mean? And just the many, many, many other inconsistencies. And him just going, you know, everything they did was perfectly a hundred percent right. Uh this is exactly how I would have did it. It's like he wouldn't criticize any but like, let's be honest, they made some mistakes and that you know. Much similar to the Kurt Cobain case, the difference with that one is now you have former chiefs and people coming out now, like Dan was saying, and so to Bleach saying, this was terrible. I, we, we would never do, this would never go like this again, you know, even if we were looking into it now. One thing <clears throat> that's semi-related I want to shout out is, I don't know if you guys have had a chance, I mentioned it to Greg online recently to see the Who Killed Malcolm X docuseries on Netflix. Um, they basically do a deep dive into the uh, Malcolm X case as a result of that, of the research in that docu series, the case is now getting reopened. That's Malcolm X assassinated in the '60s in in Harlem. You know what I mean? Um, so, 
You know what I mean? I, I, I still believe the Kurt Cobain case could get reopened with, with how that went. And especially, I mean, granted, Malcolm X is high profile. So yeah, whatever you have that. And also there was like six other presidents and super famous guys that were kind of part of that whole series. But, um, you know, it, it kind of goes to show you, dude, the thing about the Malcolm X case is this, two of the guys they locked up weren't even in the room. So, I mean, it shows you the lengths that if, if, if they want to pin something on you, Trust me, it can make it happen. One of the dudes had a doctor's uh, 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 notice and uh, I believe a leg or a knee injury. So he literally couldn't have walked in to see Malcolm speak that day. You know what I mean? So it's like, this guy did 20, I think. So, you know what I mean? Like it, it, it should really put interest into perspective for people. And granted, I know there was obviously a lot of racism in the policy of what was going on between the nation of Islam and New York police and blah, blah, blah during that Malcolm X case. But man, if they'll pin 20 years on two guys that weren't even in the room, trust me, this David Crowley thing is, is you know, it's a guy out in the woods of, of Minnesota. It's much more easier <laughs> to, to, to make it appear how you want it to. So uh, if you like soaking, soaked in bleach, I recommend everybody take that out. Uh, check out that Malcolm X docu series as well. Guys, I'm sorry. I got to grab a water. Gas, can you take it from here for a sec? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, certainly try. Um, is as aside from um, the private investigator that you hired, Dan, has anybody else at all um, actually looked into it from a total neutral perspective? Has there been anybody? I'm just curious. Well, I think the the best way to put that is no one looked into it uh, comprehensively. There's been people right. that have looked into it from a pro professional standpoint of a certain angle. Of, it, uh, of the crime scene or the bodies or the the rigor mortis that had sat in to sit in or this the scene the bodies uh the timing of things uh you know taking a chunk taking a chunk of the case and doing a deep dive into that people have done that mm -hmm. uh, but as far as looking at the big picture getting into the uh, facebook posts that were deleted after david crowley died on his very own wall um while that laptop was in police custody. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not saying the police did it, but it's things like that. Who else had uh, his, his username and password? You know, we asked mm -hmm. questions like that, but the, what we get hit back with is the password list for David Crowley was on a piece of paper for the whole world to see on the crime scene photos. Well, the question you have to ask yourself is who had before the crime scene photos were available that came out a year later, who deleted the post on his wall five days right. later? Right, 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 so right. The, the general public didn't have access to these things. And, and so we hear things of, you know, David was writing a journal. He was journalizing a lot of this, uh, a lot of the domestic disputes and domestic cases uh, involvement with his wife were in the journal. Well, we haven't seen the journal. Uh, there is no journal. There's no mention of a journal. But we do see that Dan Crowley Sr., the father, is the one that comes back later after the investigation's done and has a revelation that says, you know what, I got my son's laptop back and I was really doing a deep dive, scouring through the files, and, and I found you know, a journal, electronic journal that David wrote, and it kind of answers mm. everything. We're like, okay, time out, big, time out, big shooter. So the police had it, didn't find it, but yet... You were stumbling through his, uh, you know, files and just found a, a journal, and mm -hmm. uh, you know the question is, what did what did you know police say to that? What do you know? We asked the investigators, what came of that journal? And so, Greg's got a good recommend, uh, good connection, a, a responsible uh, connection to James Gummert, the lead detective. He's very res respectful. We agree to disagree on a lot of stuff, but he comes out and says that there was nothing. There was no journal. So why is the father of David Crowley lying when he tells people that he found and discovered a journal that explains all of this stuff? So now we have to almost bring in, you know, the father into the persons of such, uh, persons of interest to, to question, but they were never, never interviewed, never questioned. In fact, police went to them to get information on what could have possibly happened. Right. Police took these very characters that we're pointing fingers at to look into, police took them under their wing to get answers for this case, and right. so they were essentially bamboozled by their own 
thing. And I think that's why that's part of the reason police just do not want to reopen or reinvestigate this case, because it's really going to expose that they were bamboozled along the way. Right. And also were part of a cover up after the fact. But what we keep hearing and and I pr- forgot already, uh, guys, what your initial question was. I got sidetracked. But what we're getting hit with, uh, what we get hit with is they they still think that we, you know talking uh, Ross these stories with Malcolm X. Uh, there's JFK. There's RFK murders, yeah. and there's other people that obviously have already been proven. Proven. Uh, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. death has already been proven in civil court in 1999 that the government was responsible for the death, not James Earl Ray. We yeah, already know this. His to family be a sued fact. the government and what, and they sided with yeah, them and won. So I assume they won. got money for that. So I was as with Kurt Cobain, we already know the answer. Now, no one wants to touch this subject, but people look to us and say, "But why do you think the government did this? Why was David Crowley killed in a government assassination?" Greg and I look at each other and say, "I don't think we've ever said that." I, my, I myself don't believe right. the government was involved in the David Crowley killing at all. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, but there's okay. elements of agencies involved in the cover up, in the yes. subsequent backlash and the blowback from all this. There's evidence that people were involved in helping to aid and assist in the cover up of this. I personally think amateurs made the killing of the family, mm-hmm. but you need to focus on the facts. Greg's book is all facts. The fact right, right. that I mentioned to Kenneth Maines when I hired him as a private investigator, and I made sure that he didn't knew, knew nothing about the case. Right, I was right. poking and prodding him to what his thoughts were on the five-year-old girl's arm that was missing and right. Homel, the wife's hands that were both missing, and mm-hmm. David Crowley's left right hand that was missing, and the skulls that were allegedly gone or missing. Those are the facts. Those are the facts. But yet when you read the police report, you see 15 minutes of investigators saying that we see no evidence of forced entry in the front door. Well, one of the main parts of this case is that the rear slider was left partially open and unlocked in January in Minnesota. Now, wouldn't that be your shocking news as a detective to focus on the rear slider? Who came in or out of an unlocked slider? on the rear patio at ground level, you could walk right in and right out right. in January in the month, in Minnesota in the month of January. So those are the things that Greg and I are focusing on the on the evidence. Now, the only thing that I could say to new to new folks out there, I know we see that we've got uh, Mike O'Day in the, in the chat room, and he'd be interested in, in reading this script and looking at this from a documentary perspective, but I would ask someone like him, someone brand new to say, do you know that the bullet that killed David didn't even have blood on it. That's that's the thing that discredits the whole case. We aren't conspiracy theorists alleging that David didn't do this. We already know that David didn't do it. The evidence already points to the fact that the bullet was planted. Uh, There's no bullet in that house that has David's blood. He allegedly shot himself in the head with a 40 caliber weapon with a hollow point, no less. And the thing about the... The thing about the hollow point is this. When I was reading Greg's book, The Mushroomed Bullet, I, I need to figure out if hollow points mushroom because the thing I could I could see a, a standard round mushrooming, but hollow points have those four or five fragments that break well, off. And they, so, they um, I don't know if they corkscrew, but they mushroom out and they collect, right. they collect the brain, the blood, the tissue, the skin along the way going through someone's head. So you would have skull fragments on that uh, bullet fragment. You would have right. brain matter, blood, tissue, a whole array, assortment of things that they found. He shot himself upwards. The bullet went through the ceiling, allegedly, landed in the attic. Police found it, took it to the lab, and says that this is the bullet that killed David, but there's not a speck of blood on it after, after testing. Now, DNA came back that there was, there was touch DNA on that bullet. David's DNA was on that bullet from a lab perspective, not blood, but as DNA from touch, transfer, skin cells, something. Yeah, I mean, you could have touch DNA on an unfired round that you just Correct. took and loaded in a magazine, or or just touched and didn't do anything with. You know what I mean? Well, he so. would have. David would have been the one loading all that those magazines and cartridges and the weapon itself. Right. That gun was his. The cartridge right. was his. Right. His touch right. DNA would be on all those bullets, perhaps. But there's the point of the matter is. 
there's not a single drop of blood on that bullet that was found in the attic. And much like Kurt Cobain, the weapon, no fingerprints on the handgun. Yeah, no, no, and the handprint as well. Um, Dan, can you break down this this possibly forged signature uh, check that we have when there's a, what was it a sixty thousand dollar check that appeared to be uh, the, I could, uh, Dan Senior was that. possibly out of the country. I, I'd like you to mention that one because I feel like that's a fact that gets glossed over. Yeah, that's that's another that's another uh, big factor in the case from a truth from an evidence from a um, fact based research on a case like this. Uh, David Crowley's father, this this is Dan Sr. now, who allegedly found the laptop with the journal in it and all this other shenanigans, um, was yep. traveled extensively for his job. And the police report said that he was unavailable in the month of October of 2014. This is when a lot of this stuff was going on. The deaths were allegedly December, but the October, November, September timeframe, a lot of shenanigans were going on that actually point to premeditation. And so he was gone and wasn't in the country. In fact, Dan Crawley Sr. told investigators he was out of the country the entire month of October. He was in Germany. Mm -hmm. Now, what we find when the BCA lab analysis and the investigative work that comes back from the Minnesota BCA, Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, the results come back at the form of a FOIA request, and one of the files is the banking file, the banking records, and it's showing uh, David's uh, bank statements, checking accounts, nonchalant things like that. But what we see is a $50,000 cash withdrawal at a bank, Wells Fargo, a Wells Fargo bank, $50,000 cash withdrawal on October 18th of 2014, taken out at a Minnesota branch location by Dan Crowley Sr. Now we got a, we got a couple issues with that. 50,000, this wasn't an instant cash transaction at a terminal. This had to be done at a bench, at a branch bank location in front of a teller mm -hmm. that you need to show ID with. Right. And so what we looked up with because of because of Dan Crowley Sr.'s testimony to police in his own words that said he was out of the country, this withdrawal was made at a bank in Minnesota in the month of October that he said he wasn't there. So we have to assume that it wasn't Dan Crowley who did it. The question then is, who did make this withdrawal? So we went back through the records, financial records and other records, and was able to get a sample signature of Dan Crowley Sr., and then went and got uh, sample signatures of Dan Crowley Jr. This is David's older brother. Um, the, the, the account was in his name. So we number one thing we're going to do is assume that maybe it was the son who did it. And so we got uh, signature examples. And it, and it looked very simil similar to someone uh, looked like the, the brother. Looks like Dan Crowley Jr. did the signature. Now, this bank account was in – it was a – trust account uh, for the Crowley children, David, his older brother, Dan, and his uh, sister, Allison. It was a trust account. So when the old man dies, Dan Crowley, it was a, it was a paid upon death bank account, uh, a trust fund for the kids. Now a paid upon is that only money comes out of there when the person who owns it dies. So it's in Dan Crowley senior's name. He didn't die. As far as we know, he's still alive. So mm -hmm. nothing should have been coming out of that account to the kids. Right. Dan Sr. himself can do all the withdrawals and deposits he wants. That's his account. So what we think, the speculation, is that Dan Crowley Jr. went in with his ID and said, I'd like to withdraw some money from this account, and here's my identification showing I am who I am. Their middle initials were different, but the first and last name are the same. Signature looked to be roughly the same. Uh, looked like the sons. So the question is, why was a $50,000 withdrawal done at all? Dan Jr. was at the time running a small business as a personal trainer or something. He wasn't making hardly any money. So there's, a, there's right. an opportunity there that if he wanted to, that he had possibly the need for the money. Uh, who knows? Some speculate that maybe the money was taken out to pay a hitman for the killings. But that's, remember, this is October now. So that means right. premeditation 
that he wanted to hire a hitman to kill his very own brother, his flesh and blood. That's kind of a stretch for some people to believe, but it's on the table nonetheless. Um, now, we don't hear anything back from the father who wanted to argue or fight this to, to say, hey, that, that wasn't me, or of course, confirming the fact that, yes, I was home and I did make that $50,000 withdrawal. Now, the old man, right. probably the senior, was known by locals in his hometown as a millionaire. Uh, he had cash, uh, and that account was fluctuating between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars at any given time. That fund account for the kids, I think, it even topped out at five hundred thousand at one time. But he was using right. that as a as a savings account for the kids one day. So he wouldn't have needed fifty thousand in cash probably ever. I, right. I don't know why he'd ever right. need that. And so. We did have speculation that maybe there was a withdrawal and then someone made a deposit the next day or something. So we looked into that too. Um, there were no deposits in the subsequent days or weeks of 50,000, putting that money back in if they needed it in a, in a crunch, maybe to bail out somebody from, uh, from jail. And then you go and you put it back in. There was no deposit back in. So the money came out. So there we've got a problem. 50,000 withdrawal, unrelated. This is unrelated to the Crowley murder case. We've got a problem. Normal detectives and investigators looking into the case would already be contacting the bank by saying, that now it looks like we've got a potential fraud issue here. The old yeah. man is out of the country. Who's withdrawing the money and why? And why? What happened to it? Nothing was looked into. Nothing was researched. And nothing was followed up on by the Apple Valley Police Department by looking at that. Now, if you look at the date on that takeout slip, uh, and the person filling it out, the bank teller who was filling out the form, there was a date. It was crossed off, and the new date was written. And then the person had another cross off, and the information was, was written. It looked by an amateur, someone looking at it for the first time like myself, that the bank teller was distracted when she was filling out this information. She was distracted, wasn't paying attention. And so Dan Jr., the brother, who the way we think took the money out, is known as a smooth talking con artist to begin with. Well, I could easily see him conning the the young female bank teller while getting this done, talking about something off the side, and her getting distracted that she's got to cross off and put the correct date and fill out some the account number was wrong, she had to fill it out again. So this is speculation on our part. This isn't fact. Right. Right. But nonetheless, it appears it does appear that that bank Teller was distracted by something for some reason. Uh, and if he shows an idea that the name matches up, um, she would have given it to him. Now, right. I don't think she would have looked at the middle initial that it was different. But the question that I have after all this is why did Dan Crowley Jr. make an attempt to make a Dan Crowley Sr. signature on a bank file? It was a poorly done forgery is what it was. Right. So That's what I was getting to. Dan Sr., but why didn't Dan Jr., if it was actually him, or if he didn't want to cause any suspicion, sign his own name. Like yeah. he, he made it look like the writing, the handwriting style of the father to get the money. Now, was that part of a hit, a payment, a hit man or an assassin or two to be paid? That would fall in line with fam killing a family of three if you look at the $10,000 to $15,000 ahead for a murder in a typical case like that. Possibly. I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not well versed in that type of stuff, but it falls in line. Let's leave it at that. Now, Dan Jr. is left handed. So now this all t ties back together. We got a bank issue, which I still think is, should be open to this day as a bank fraud situation. But we got blood hand right on the wall that says Allah Akbar on the Crowley family home written in blood, which some of the letters looks like it came from a person writing with a left hand. Now, I'm not saying anything. I'm not leading any speculation, but if Dan Crowley Jr. had something to do with the money or the hiring or to get the script into his lap, did he or possibly could he have been at the scene? Maybe not did the killing, but wrote the uh, impact, uh, impact on the wall with the blood. That's up for that's conjecture right now. But some letters were with the left hand. David Crowley was right handed. The words in all uppercase Allahu Akbar was written on the wall in the living room. So we already got more and more things that don't make sense. David was right-handed. The gun was found to his left hand, but there's someone left-handed writing on the blood on the wall. So we got a right. whole Florida scenario. So the, the conclusion to this 
to my whole rambling here is this. If Dan Sr. comes back from Germany, and now is best looking into the investigation of his one son that's already dead, goes through some paperwork, bank financial statements to find out something his other son may or may not have done, would he be likely to call authorities and expose the other son to say, what the hell are you doing? Right. Now, that, he's going to be put away for a long time if he does that. Now you're dealing with the position of a father. Are you going to see both of your kids now gone, or would you already have one son that's gone? Do you save the other one and say, let's brush it under the table, and you know what? Let's go along with this conspiracy that David did it. And that's what we're getting the consensus of the members of the group is that while Dan right. probably Sr. may not have had anything to do with it, because he's more than likely involved or complicit in the cover-up and the possible getting rid of the mother in the case, who was the only person, according to law enforcement, that didn't necessarily buy this whole suicide yeah. scenario was Kate Crowley. Right. She's At what point are you going to implicate yourself? Winds up dead yeah. seven months later. And so he may be implicated with that death. He may be implicated with the covering up of the fraud charges at the bank that he didn't want to expose because that's going to send his other son to prison. Um, more than likely, he is involved with the cover up of some way, shape or form uh, as far as him finding this manifesto or this journal on the laptop. This is the same guy we're talking about now in the documentary. People are reading that the family members are talking about their interactions with their with David. Dan Sr. is the one on the documentary that's actually reading from a script by saying, you know, David did this and David did this and too bad David killed his family and stuff. Here's a final journal entry on December 25th, Christmas Day. I'm going to kill my family today. You know, he's the only one on that documentary that really looks like he's reading something, that he's not being yeah. up. He's, right. he's acting. And so that's what the... I think the general consensus of our justice page of the members is that he may be not involved with the killings, um, but he's obviously involved with something else because none of none of his behavior makes any sense. Um, since you mentioned Kate, correct me if I'm wrong, but you uncovered that Dan Jr. receives another payment once again after the passing of his mother. Is that correct? He, uh, what I did with Another her case, inheritance. Um, uh, it was not the inheritance per se, but if you check the legal documents at the courthouse after his mother died, he was the first one asking to open up that death benefit scenario to do mm -hmm. the estate. It was, mm -hmm. uh, he was the, not the claimant, not the defendant. Uh, so he was the one who first came in and brought and ensured that the county in that county that they uh, started proceeding with the death benefits for the estate of his mother. And he was holding the garage sale of the house and the property and her belongings. Now, David's gone. The sister lives in another state. Um, odds are that he would have been holding the garage sale uh, anyway uh, in, 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 right. in charge of that. Or maybe he's the one going to the courthouse to open the estate. But nonetheless, we have it in writing that he's the one who opened the estate planning the estate uh, for his dead mother was him, Dan Jr. And did you get a, an amount on that with David gone? Do we do we know no. how much? Okay. So um, she wouldn't have been. She wouldn't have been um, worth a lot or anything um, right. large like, like that. So it wouldn't have been a motive. Her death, the motive for her death would have been um, her exposing things in the family. Uh, maybe she would have gotten in the way could have been potentially a roadblock for this uh, bank fraud situation that the, the dad was covering up for the son. Right. That would have, right. if that hit the news and made a big story, she could be certainly one to step up. Um, she wasn't uh, afraid to, to voice her concerns. Let's put it that way. So even in the, in the police investigation, she said, I don't believe that, that date, my son did this unless she said, unless it was in the form of a pact or some sort of agreement so already that scenario was was in play when they went to the investigator. Someone planted that whole uh, pack theory to the family. And I don't know who that is. Absolutely, it was right. planted. Yeah, there's a there's a few people that give kind of uh, you know 
quotes or I guess information, if you want to call it information on the on the pact theory. Um, let's let's head back to the gray stage and because uh, I want to get into some more of Greg's book. Um, Dan, you did the foreword for uh, the book. Uh, Greg, Greg asked you to do that. So is there anything you guys, you know, uh, anything extra informationally that you want people to know about your book, Greg? Um, um, well, I know Dan had mentioned that he spoke with um, uh, several several people, but Dan Hinnon also spoke with Kamel's father and Kamel's sister. Mm -hmm. and, um, I, I think there was, you know, I put some of that into my book, but um, – Dan, after speaking with them, do you think that they would have been open to looking deeper into this, similar to how David's mom was? Well, you're you're right. David's mom knew something was was goofy. You know, his his father signed up for the deal right away, and you know went along lock, stock, and barrel with what the investigator said. All the friends went along with it. Remember, David's friends were all conspiracy theorists. They were alternative media. <laughs> That, that would have looked at this case like, what what happened? How can this even be? You know, and right. connected to Alex Jones, who would have been, this would have been top news story every every day of his show, would have been the Carly Right. He was silent. Right. So the people that stood out were Kate, the mother, who, who's now six feet under, and the Alam family. Mr. Alam, when I spoke with him, said that he was busy, as he was, dealing with his wife, Nala, Nyla, uh, Nyla uh, Alam had a case of cancer, uh, ovarian cancer that she was dealing with, and she was in hospice care when all this went down. Yes, a terminal illness. Yeah. She, she had a terminal illness. Uh, she did not have the time, energy, or the resources to follow up on this. But he told me right. on our phone call, if I had time and money, I would want to look into this to find out what really happened because this doesn't make sense. Right. That's what he himself said. Now, we don't hear anything more from him. He says later that he's open to doing the documentary, which he did. But like Greg said earlier in the podcast here, when, he the, final version, when the final version came out of that documentary, Anjum Alam, who I still think is a good guy in all this, says, mm -hmm. I'm done. This is not how you presented this documentary to be. I don't want any part of it. And he goes, you're taking my daughter out as well. They had interviewed the daughter Sidra for a group. Mm. They says you're removing everything out that has to do with any of us if you want to release this film. And so they did. They took it out. They uh, put in some B-roll footage of other other interviews, and they, you know, published the movie. But if you notice, like Greg Fernandez said, what's in the documentary is important, but also what's not in the documentary. Right. Someone right. watching, for instance, Gaz, when you watched it, did that pique your interest at all by saying? Why isn't Comel's parents in this documentary? Everything was the crowd. Exactly. exactly. It, it, it just felt like there was another missing piece. And as somebody going in there with a completely neutral perspective, you would want to hear that other, other opinion, that other viewpoint. And that wasn't there. So, yeah, totally. So they were, in, um, they, they were involved and wanted to do it. You know, they were in. Mm -hmm. But I think, they, and the other thing that the sister said was, she said, I'll, I will, I'll be in this uh, film. Uh, and the dad says he'll be in it. But the dad made sure that he said, when you film it, I want to have my daughter with me at all times. I don't want to have her be interviewed solo because he knew potentially there's that option of being um, manipulation played or led down with some leading questions and things like that. He says, She's going to do it, but she's going to do it with me. So all the parts that they interviewed them were they went to a local hotel in Dallas and filmed the parts in a hotel room, but both were together. But when they got the final review to say, how does it look, the final version before it went public, they says no. Now, the interesting thing is, Greg, with the final version, you and I were in the movie and never even heard that a final version came out or a preliminary or to ask what our thoughts were on it. Right, they right. They didn't want anything by us. We just found out later that it was done and it got out there they didn't send us a link to say hey guys we're going to go to Tri tribeca film festival uh you know forward some people send some links out on social media and help us promote it we yeah we our our role was done there our role was to be thrown under the bus we both interviewed for two hours and what was made in the movie was two 30 second clips 
Yeah. No, what is the point the of ha- having someone in and then not even telling them when it's going to, like you said, if you're planning to go to the Oscars and go all the way to the top, you would want every single person involved to promote as much as possible. Well, yeah, you, you, you want to promote what you've been involved with, don't you? Yeah. yeah. We, and we, we, we didn't even know until the movie came out. Someone on the Justice page said, hey, you guys know that they're, they're showing the film at the Tribeca Film Festival. We're like, yeah. <laughs> Which Ridiculous. One? Oh, the one we're in? They said, yeah, you're in it. D- didn't they have Greg swatting a fly or something? I mean, w- 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 with all, like, the... the, the so the fly great... owner said, he <laughs> yeah. it during the interview, that's what they put in the movie. That's right. what the answer it, it, right it's, there. it's like the Twilight Zone. With all the great research that Dan has done, and, you know, and Greg as well, and, like, as far as asking you guys intellectual questions to get an, an informed answer, which is what a documentary would be, one would think, you know what I mean? Since you brought up uh, uh, Comel's uh, mother and the terminal illness, to make things weirder, to show people how far the rabbit hole goes with this weird stuff, is this point when this GoFundMe pops up to collect money at, uh, on the Facebook? And is that not Dan Jr. again, who's who's the beneficiary of that? And they collect a bunch of money. Then it gets shut down right away. I have to assume that that was Andrew who, who, who wasn't with it because – random people collecting money on a GoFundMe and, and under the auspices of a terminal illness, no less is like, seems absolutely despicable. You know, well, that, that is, that is one of the things, uh, Ross, glad you brought it up. We don't touch on that enough, but when the page first got started, we really focused on that GoFundMe campaign. The campaign was set up after the, after David Comel and Rania uh, were killed in this horrendous uh, event. Um, that it was first announced, I think, on the page is Dan Crowley wrote it or Danny August Mason wrote it and says, we found out today that our friend uh, passed away. <laughs> We're like, well, that's odd. You know, they were yeah. brutally murdered. So, so then yeah. they die. Andrew Malam is dealing with his wife down in Waco, Texas, in a hospice uh, care because of her yeah. ovarian cancer, and they're right. having a tough time paying bills. What comes up on the gray state Facebook page group, not ours, but the group says we're yeah. having a GoFundMe to raise six million dollars. That's what it was. To raise money for medical issues for Nyla. The ma- the fund name was a medical fund for the Crowley a Crowley slash Alam Medical Fund. Mm-hmm. So Greg and I look at each other like why would Crowley's name be on the medical fund? That that's odd. Right. Uh, the very next day I log in put 20 bucks to the donation. No, 15. I donate $15 to this fund. I get automatic reply back, thanks for the donation, signed by Dan Crowley Jr. Boom. I get my screenshot. So why why is Dan Crowley Jr. involved with this at all? He doesn't even know the woman. Doesn't right. even live in Texas. And right. may have met her once or twice. But when you go to GoFundMe, you go to create a campaign, it forces you to put in a goal amount. Mm-hmm. Now, Greg and I have looked into this. Other cancer, people dying of cancer, people going in for treatment, unexpected child cancer, they're going to raise $100,000, $200,000. Uh, you don't see a million out there. I've never seen a million, much right. less $6 million. Right. And so I go to Sidra and I said, why is Dan Crowley Jr. involved in a GoFundMe? Uh, why is he working on this? And she brought it up to her dad, Anjum, and he says, you're shutting this thing down. I didn't even know about it. I knew nothing about this. No one asked me, See, where this is, this is... Money, where's this money even going? Right. That's... So he had him shut it down. I get the money. I get the receipt. Next thing you know, the fund had raised $8,000 a few uh, – it was a week later, I think. The fund was shut down. We don't know to this day where the 8000 went to, but why was Dan Crowley Jr.'s hands in the cookie jar once again? So did your payment get kicked back to you? Do nope, you know, or it, just, went, so, it went through. And like you said about the head of the cookie jar, everything with this guy just seems like a complete lie. This is just oh, you're, not, you're dealing with complete Connor. lack of empathy. And, and every time it's like it almost it's like a trip to the bank. It's the fake GoFundMe. It's always it seems to be money motivated. And you know what I'm saying? That's just yeah. it, uh, David. I think what David found out in the last months of his life that his inner circle, including his own brother, uh, he was infest. He was infested and infiltrated by the snakes in his own group. Right. So he started to try to distance himself 
from some of these people, including his own father, that he turned down a couple times from babysitting his own daughter. He knew something was up and he goes, I'm trying to distance. But the narrative, and Greg can back me up on this, the narrative we see in the movie is that David was isolating himself because he was in uh, depression. He was financially in dire straits. He didn't know what to do after the company, after the movie makers says, no thanks, we don't want to have your filthy script, you're done. Um, they used that and turned it against David that he was isolating himself and was in a deep depression that ultimately took his life. That's how they spun it. Yeah, not not knowing that, you know, he could have had, you know, completely legitimate and good reasons for every every decision he made. Um, let's, uh, let's get back into the book, because I've been reading this the past few days, uh, The Gray Stage, and uh, Greg does a really excellent deep dive into the case and, and lays out the, the facts, as Dan said earlier, uh, in, in quite a good uh, timeline. I mean, you, you pretty much cover everything in there, Greg, so it's kind of hard to uh, break down any one thing. But <clears throat> one thing that's interesting to me, that I come from a bit of a background of researching this myself, is this chapter I finished recently on this uh, possible paranormal activity that Sidra has when staying over with, with Ronnie. Um, I just want to get your thoughts on what could have happened here and, and how you presented that chapter with this uh, possible paranormal activity in the, in the house. I think, I think there was something there, you know, and then after watching a gray state and watching what did, what they did put into that film with Kamel talking about how she heard something, she yeah. felt, she felt a presence. I do believe that there is, there is a paranormal aspect to this case. And that is something that you're never going to be able to really prove. So right. I get why people don't spend a lot of time on it. You know, it's it, it's like it, it's it's a big hook um, because it's one of the biggest ways that they can discount everything that all of the research, everything that we've done. Sure. Once, once they hear that, they're like, "Oh, okay, these guys are really crazy." Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But I, you know, I think what what she said was truthful, and um, I don't have any reason to doubt it. And I think what made it into the to a gray state pretty much con confirmed what Sidra, what Kamel's sister said. It's really weird the way that it's in that film and how they don't really touch on it. They they're just again they're they're just hitting beats. It's just beats to just stir up thoughts from different people people that have had those type of things happen are going to just gravitate towards that people that think that that is complete bs are just going to not even go down that road they're going to turn turn the whole film off and never look at this case so Absolutely. you know it's it, that's the only thing that i can say is um i do believe that that stuff can be real um i know one of the biggest theories one of the biggest anti-theories to the ghost theory to a paranormal thing is that they were TIs, that they were a targeted people mm -hmm. and that that's, that's why, you know, um, they, they weren't really seeing anything. They weren't really hearing anything. Somebody was putting that into their brain, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know anything about that. You know, all that I can say is this is what she said. This is what Sidra said. She said that she saw a presence there. This is not when they, the other thing, the bigger thing is this is not when they lived at 1051 Ramsdale Drive. This is, uh, I think of this was in 2013 or 2012. So this is, you know, prior to all of that happening. But okay, so this is a different house than different where house. the deaths take. Okay, see, I did not pick that up oh. when I was reading that chapter. Okay, I'm glad you cleared that up for me. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's just like it's it's one of those things that I didn't want to focus too much on, um, but at the same time, I felt that it was uh, necessary because that's what she she told me. And right, right. Well, you know what? That's information that you uncovered. I still appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate you for putting that in there because you could have easily left it out. You could have easily glossed over yeah. it and took the A gray state route. Like, <laughs> well, this is what she told me, but I don't believe in anything outside of. The physicality in front of me so you know just gloss over it type thing um go ahead guys i was going to say well it's approaching it with an open mind and you want to look at all theories to try exactly. and answer the answer um that's what that says to me 
I, I think we lost Dan, but luckily we got a lot of information. Oh, I think we got him back. back. Boom. Yeah, back. back Dan. That um, was the uh, ghost that killed Dan. <laughs> right when we covered that part. It's 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 well, when, just when he... been rewrote as a lead. Um, but I won't go into my recent run. <laughs> the way this show has to go, it like, has to go that way, right? Um, yeah. So, just before I cut out there, uh, Ross, you brought up a good point. And maybe that's uh, another good point for a lot of the new members. David and Kamel lived in an apartment uh, when they first got married and moved to Minnesota. They were they were in right. Dallas or Waco or uh, Texas. She went to Baylor University. Another strange thing, it's a Baptist Christian university, and she's Muslim. Right, right. So, so they moved to Minnesota. They live in an apartment, have the baby. Uh, then they just moved the prior December. They were in that house 12 months, only one year in Apple Valley in that actual house. And in fact, there's emails that have also been uh, leaked a couple of years ago that show them working with a real estate agent in California to move to LA. Mm -hmm. And so they were in interested, not only was the, was the script ready to go and he was signing off on the deals of the uh, movie web-based series, they were signing off on the options and things like that. They were looking at real estate homes in, in California to move because he was going to be closer to the to the film and uh, closer to the whole thing. So they were very happy, looking forward to the future, and did not have uh, money problems at all. Um, sorry, but that's that's a good point. They were just in that house twelve months, and all this happened. Sure, I mean one of the things that you know it it is just super frustrating about you know about this to me is like you know granted Gaz and I had limited, limited contact with David it's like I would have loved to reach out to him and consult to him if he wasn't this supposed state of isolation but we've only spoken to someone a few times in business you know it's kind of hard to open up that kind of emotional channel and the other thing about the whole Dark Straits financially thing is the check from Dan Crowley Senior, senior sitting outside on the front steps like while well, the family is essentially dead in, inside the house is like the most frustrating part in the world to me because it's like if it really was a financial thing and there's this check outside on the front door that no one checked it's like little things like that drive me insane and obviously you can't go back in time and change the circumstances but it's just like i guess it's another part that doesn't really add up for me um what we were uh, talking about uh, when, you, when you just dipped out there for a second again was the uh, parallel activity uh, kind of uh, chapter that uh, or at least mentioned that uh, Greg has in his book and also how they present that in the, you know, um, uh, Comel is hearing voices, she's cracking, she's going down this downward spiral with, with David, you know, we can't, we can't trust her, she's in the pact, she's com compromised, right? But then Sidra, who we have, assuming nothing but genuine information from also has the same report as well. So that's, you know, kind of conflicting in, in my opinion with, with what you're showed in the, in the a gray state. Uh, yeah, one point I want to bring up on that, Greg, uh, we did or for, for Ross and Gaz as well, is that the paranormal stuff was, I believe legit in that previous house. And there may right. have been something paranormal in the current house, uh, right. but to, to, but to reiterate, it had nothing to do with the murder of the three. For sure. um, much like saying David was drinking absinthe or using mushrooms, uh, we think there's evidence to support those things as being factual or true, but it doesn't relate to the deaths of these three people. So we have to discount it and focus on just the facts. Um, Absolutely. Were they a happily married couple? It sounds like all looks of it was. Did they have some arguments or discrepancies? Um, more likely it did, but we can't focus on that because that had nothing to do with the killing. There may have right. been paranormal activity. There may have been strange things going on, but uh, someone still shot David and it wasn't, wasn't him, wasn't himself. So we've got an issue there. So those things are true. The other part of the documentary that Eric Nelson did with A Gray State was he inserted a lot of the video footage that David took. David was filming mm -hmm. all the time making audio recordings all the time. He was a producer, a filmmaker. He was recording his child in the backyard playing. He was recording everything. Right. So they had access to all these gigabytes of data. And that's when they started cherry picking the items to use in the film that cast David in a poor light. Now the video footage is true. It's not a hoax. That's actual video footage that was used. Um, are they using it in a in a way to construe something and, and you know lead the 
viewer down a wrong path, yes. But it's not a hoax. It's not made up. It's not footage that's not photoshopped. Yeah, it's created. Or... It is footage. There's there's footage of David doing some strange things. There's footage of Comel doing some very strange things. There's footage of Rania having a tantrum in, in the basement. Those are actual, actual footage. But the way they presented it is to shed bad light on the family and to right. discredit David, discredit Comel, and discredit Rania. The, the, the Alam family, and this is my last thing. I got I to gotta jump off here uh, in a few minutes. The Alam mm-hmm. family was more disgusted. Remember this, Greg, when we found out when the movie came out, after they took their pieces out of Anjum and Sidra, the sister and the father of, Alam, of, uh, of, of the Alam family. Uh, they did, Eric Nelson and his, and his staff obliged and took those pieces out. What they put in, or what they, the reason they got angry, I think, uh, Greg, was the hallucination scene that they put in on purpose to discredit Comel, who had nothing to do with this whole murder case. Right. That's the thing that when Anjum saw that and Sidra, they're like, no, you're really trying to put a spin on this whole documentary, and we yeah. got out. So they inserted yeah. that not only to discredit David, they went so far as to discredit his wife, who's another For sure. innocent victim in this case that they threw under the bus. That that to me is sickening. Yeah, I I, I totally agree. Um, do you want to shout out uh, any any of the uh, recent series of cases you're following, Dan, and just where people can uh, find you and uh, to join the justice group? Uh, group they can join the justice now? group uh, there. Uh, I'm under DM Hennen on Twitter and YouTube channel under Dan Hennen. There's also a justice uh, page for, uh, I'm following the, the Jennifer Jane's author, uh, The Strange Death in November from her. She's the Amazon bestseller author. Her body was found. Uh, she was writing some books on the anti-vaccination world, anti-vax, and mm-hmm. uh, young, healthy, two boys that she loved, who two twins, and allegedly shot herself um, one day. So that that is strange. Uh, Greg and I have both followed the Philip Marshall case in Calaveras mm-hmm. County, Minnesota, uh, California. We've got a justice page for that. And most recently, I've been covering the uh, with DHS whistleblower Philip Haney's strange death that took place in Plymouth, California last month, where they said he allegedly shot himself. He had a book coming out. He was engaged to be married and was blowing the whistle on some things. And the official narrative that he pulled over on 12 Wayside West Rest uh, got himself out of the car, shot himself, and uh, they ruled it a suicide. Um, and so that's another case that obviously isn't the case. He's blowing the whistle on some things that took place in the Obama White House years ago. Right. But a uh, religious man, a very faithful guy, uh, and Christian, and they said he just uh, killed himself. So those are some of the cases that I've been following, but um, you could reach me there. Uh, but Greg's book, I just want to say that there's 16 chapters in Greg's book. Each chapter of this book goes into a deep dive on a particular topic, and it's backed up and sourced by the facts. Who made the quote, who sourced it, who said it, who stated it, and where it came from. Nothing in this book is from a Greg Fernandez as far as an opinion or a slant until the very end he talks about uh, some, of his, some of the situations in the, in the, in the case. But mm-hmm. these 15 chapters are fact-based. Not only fact-based, there's a source list at the back of the book that provides the link to every single thing that he's talking about. Many of this is right from the law enforcement's mouths themselves or the detectives. Yeah. Quotes. Direct interviews. Quotes from the police chief. Quotes from the lead investigator. Uh, actual quotes that that uh, we've, we've caught them so many times in, I don't, I don't want to go as far as to say lies, Greg, but caught them in uh, statements that are, I'll just leave it at this, contradictory statements. Yeah, Family inconsistencies. and law enforcement are very contradictory. And so Greg does a good job pulling all this stuff together um, in, in his book. I think it's the best book that's out there on this, on this case uh, at all. Uh, 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 go, go. Um, there's just that analogy there where he's saying about uh, re- referring to um, their answers for want of a better word um, Dan it reminds me of an episode of UFO Hunters years ago where they were they were interviewing it was a very senior ranking general and he, they asked him outright you know he's not going to confirm anything and he was kind of smiling like 
you know, his eyes were saying something else, man. Right? Like, you know, I can neither confirm nor deny, but everything his eyes revealed, yes, you're onto something, but I can't say. So, yeah, I just thought okay. it was interesting here, there. Ken, a minute. Um, I do want to say the one thing about, I guess, the. Um, I, I don't even know what the what the word was, but the accusation of David's, uh, you know, occultism and kind of ritual ceremony thing. Um, when he makes this statement that like he has a soft spot for the Antichrist, like maybe I just interpreted that wrong, but I interpreted that from a uh, sc- screenwriting perspective. Like so he has like a soft spot for people using the Antichrist concept and writing about it. I didn't really if he was a you know a Christian and all that. He has a soft spot for the Antichrist, which is like it's a guy he would like, you know, like to have a beer with and, and get to know sometime. I thought he meant, you know, specifically using the concept in, in writing was how I I took it, you know what I mean? But I suppose it's it's open to interpretation of <clears throat> a couple other cases I want to throw out there real quick just before Dan goes. Um, the Michael Rupert case, uh, the guy who created the uh, Collapse book and documentary, you know, he he supposedly committed suicide. I mean, apparently that one is confirmed, but. With the content that he was covering in Collapse, I have to say that that's highly questionable. And also, um, Hunter S. Thompson, you know, the timing of, of his suicide. Again, he's covered a lot of, you know, kind of inflammatory stuff. But uh, he was writing the <clears throat> Kingdom of Fear book about 9-11 and the Bush administration response to 9-11. So, I mean, this this whole suicide thing comes up a lot is basically, you know, you know the, the whole point I'm trying to make. Or you just have something like Malcolm X where... They're just going to blame some guys that literally were nowhere to be found when the actual event happens. But um, thank Dan very much. I want to thank him for his work on the uh, case and also helping out Greg with uh, the uh, Gray Stage uh, book and uh, spending time with us here today. Um, definitely shout out to all the truthers in the group and uh, make sure you guys keep following Greg, Greg and Dan's work in the, in the group. Um, been, been a grand old time having you boys. I do have some more uh I want to go back into the screenplay with Greg because uh, I have my opinion coming and uh, I honestly thought it needed some work, man. Like I, I saw a very uh, working in, in a working status form in the, in, in the script, which again, we don't know. This could be literally the first prototype, right? Because we don't know if this is a, I would say it doesn't appear to be a final copy, but um, man, I, I for sixty thousand dollars into the and what we saw with the concept trailer, man, I expected a lot more for the screenplay, man. Like I was, I was really excited that was going to be on, you know, blockbuster level, especially you know with the amount of detail that's in the concept trailer. You know, that that's where I was at with it. Well, they remember they remember they they made that trailer for six thousand dollars, and that was back right, in twenty twelve. Right. Absolutely, and um, what. And if you look at the concept trailer, it's very, very different from David's script, from the Absolutely. May 12th script, you know. But whatever our, our view is on uh, David Crowley's script, um, the main thing is that that script is what created that that deal. That was oh, for sure. the, the – For sure. You know. Well, the, I mean, I would the say night- the concept oh, trailer called- created the deal. But obviously, he's not, no, he's not selling them right. a couple of minute concept trailers. You said he's selling them a, 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 a feature film screenplay. So, you're right. You know, I totally yeah. agree. Yeah, you're definitely right on that. Yeah. Um, you know, but, because uh, if, you, if you get three million views, it's much easier to say, like, hey, dude, this got millions. You know, like, it's not, you're not going to it with a 200 view trailer. Like, it's really good. Trust me. <laughs> like, well, that, would, that would be the other thing, too, I guess, is to go back and look at, um, before everybody found out that David Crowley died, how many views did that trailer have? And then after right. his death, how many did it generate? But I still think it's at least one million, two two million views before he died. I forget. Yeah, what that's what I, I think. Was, it's right? like between a million, a million point five oh after, God. and then that's you know, like you said, a gray state with the the botch rise coming out. Obviously, you guys as group and a lot of other. Not that you guys are necessarily. You guys are following the case. You're not necessarily saying, hey, go watch the concept trailer. But I assume a lot of people are finding it from you guys' research if, yeah. they, if they hadn't previously heard of it. Um, yeah, so. they definitely are. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I really liked it. You know, I, I really thought that the, the script, um, there, was, there was a few things that I would have taken out. I think, 
you know, the one thing that, that we learn is everything in that script has to make sense. It has to lead you into the next scene. And there were a couple things that I thought that he could have taken out that, but that, you know, that's just small nitpicky things too. But um, I, I really thought that if you were to take out the fall of the dollar and replace it with what we're seeing now, you pretty much have what is, what is happening now. Oh, for sure. I mean, I'm not arguing with the relevancy, you know what I mean? And, and also, you know, the other pro problem with it is a lot, that whole pre-apocalyptic martial law, mark of the beast. I mean, all of those things are stuff that like Alex Jones covered in like, you know, police state 2000, like, and I'm not just saying, you know, that was David's one resource. There's like a million documentaries that cover that stuff. You know sure. what I mean? My whole problem is, like you said, it, it's very different for the concept trailer. And if very what good. you're, what you're pitching us is these concepts for the concept concept trailer, but then you take out the Masonic uh, beheading because maybe that's too inflammatory. You take out the public X. There was certain imagery that I was sure. expecting to see in the, in the feature film because it was like these big moments in the trailer. You're like, it, it was what I'm talking about is impact the, the right. emotional impact I had from seeing the, the visuals. And like you said, I think they covered it in a gray state too. When you see those, uh, black armored FEMA, FEMA troopers kind of beating down the, the, the peasants, you know what I mean? And then time magazine basically has a cover that is something that you've seen in the gray state trailer. And it kind of has that kind of mainstream imagery. I was expecting this, you know, to really see that. And what I felt really lacked was like the emotion. Like I didn't feel this emotion from the screenplay that was a, a impending doom of, of the of the suppression of our freedom. If what we're talking about is the right. whole c collapse, but before yeah. our eyes, that comes with a very emotional, like you're gonna walk outside your door and you're gonna be on your own. No one is gonna come to save you, not the police, not the National Guard, not, you know what I mean? Not only right. that, to take it a step further, you're going to, you might be an enemy, <laughs> you might be a non-combatant. So then, then like, not only are you fighting for your own survival, you are fighting oppression, you know, and that's that I, I felt not to say that they couldn't sell it to these Hollywood writers that a lot of people were saying in the group, but, um, uh, but yeah, but, but the big thing, ahead. um, one, one thing that we need to, I mean, the script starts out, Right. Well, I mean, it starts out in Afghanistan first. So they're chasing Osama bin Laden. He yeah. gets away, blah, blah, blah. But when the movie really starts, the collapse has already happened. So they're exactly. already under this. So they are. Right. Yeah. So David's character, Daniel Walker, is already there. And he's it's he the the twist is when he becomes the person who is a victim of a false flag. So there is a right. bombing that happens and he's blamed for it. And so then it's like, okay, why would they ever blame him for it? Now, if you watch the first scene and if you watch some of that stuff, you kind of get a, get a glimpse. So I, I get that there's pieces missing because it's like, okay, what made him so special that they had to blame him for this, right. false, for this false flag? I think the tie that David Crowley, the writer, was trying to make was that they were after him for whatever he did in Afghanistan. For sure. And, for and sure. looking at D the David Crowley case, speaking with some soldiers who are very reluctant to go public about David Crowley and, and all of that, there have been some weird theories about things that happened when David Crowley served and that things that he might have seen people that might have been killed curses that might have happened to these people who hmm. ran over children over in Afghanistan, things like yep. that. Theories, theories, yep, yep. all but you, obviously that stuff you won't find in my book. There is a lot that you will not find in this, in this particular book. Um, but you know, that's a big rabbit hole. When you start thinking about yeah. what did David Crowley go through while he served, he was served at the worst possible time. I mean, think about that. What, 2005 to two, 2009? That's horrible. I mean, this is right yeah. after September 11th. This is right when they go, go in there. There are so many stories that you could talk with any soldier who served over there during that time. It's hell. It was yeah. hell. I mean, I'll put it like this, you know, since we've been dealing with this whole fiasco, and I mean all of us, you know, I've been following it, you and Dan have been on the front line as I 
when this, you know, obviously, if you guys don't know, I was an investor in the crowdfunding. And, it, and it's like, for me, it's like, all I ever asked is that, you know, I would have loved to have a, a, a conversation with Danny August Mason about what is the plan for the project, given that you guys got 60000 plus dollars, it crashed and burned, this thing happened to David, it's copyrighted, so the script can't move for 70 years. Well, uh, I would have loved to, to have that discussion because if you would have ever ha had that dialogue with him, I would have definitely given that question to you. Like, dude, ask him this. And, you know, when I when I mentioned that I did this uh, Champion of Liberty perk for, for $1,000, which, you know, I, I, I make enough money independently of music that I'm able to do such things. I know a lot of people can't. But we talked about it when I came on with you and Dan way back when someone put $10,000 into this crowdfunding campaign. It was Sean Wright and Eric Sayward or whoever else messaging you guys on Facebook and threatening you guys that they're going to do something. Bro, if I put $10,000 into your crowdfunding campaign and you guys freaking shelf the project, I would have been Googling every single one of your addresses and showing up to, to your door, knocking on your front door to have a conversation, bro. I would have went down the list. I would have had a face to face with everything. The thousand dollars I can eat and it's whatever, because like I said, I'm a screenwriter myself. I, I have my own crew where we do these kind of stuff. And so I would, I was kind of thinking not something I would ever say on camera, hint, hint, hint. But if I were to write a similar project, I would, I would think about dedicating it to David to try to get this done, how I would get it done. And I, I see what you're saying about David using uh, his personal influences, and 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 of course he has to use his his own his own personal experience to write. That's the only way that you can write, right? But right. I also felt that it I, it somewhat lost focus with the whole Iraq and Afghanistan Bin Laden thing. I know that David used that sure. through line because that's his personal experience. Makes perfect sense for him writing it. For me writing it, I think I would avoid bin Laden and Iraq and Afghanistan altogether because sure. at one point it's slightly outdated at this time. And for two, if you already don't know about that stuff, I don't think it's necessary to helping you understand a pre-apocalyptic dystopian fall of the fabric of the, the government or whatever we're talking about here, the collapse of capitalism. You know what I mean? Right. Give, me, give me one second, guys. I'll be right back. Hold Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Okay. I'm I'm going to have to actually go in a couple of minutes, guys. It's it's twelve thirty here, and so we are going to have to wrap things up um, in a moment. For sure, no worries. Do you have anything else on uh, on that stuff, guys? No, I'm I'm to be honest with you, and this is to everyone watching. Listen, I'm and I'll, I'll be straight up. I'm completely out of my depth because I'm a complete noob to this, and I don't really know anything about it. Uh, I've like I said, we I watched the documentary on Netflix. I've read a couple of articles. Um, I'm still more com <laughs> I just come out even more confused. There's definitely, as I've, as I've repeated throughout the show, there's definitely something missing. Um, but I don't have that knowledge, um, you know, about everything related to it. Um, what's going on? Um, I just think though it's interesting that the guys have been approaching it with. Uh, many different angles, you know, from paranormal to whatever, and right. it's not going on a conspiracy theory. It's just saying, hey, we're asking questions here. There's more to this. We just want to try and find out, basically, what happened. Well, um, I mean, you you know that like how long I followed this to basically this discussion. Yeah, I, I haven't, bro. So I this, think well, at least with the project. I mean, this discussion me and Greg are having is interesting because of the concept trailer. I was a David Crowley Gray State fan, and Greg wasn't. Now that this feature, this so-called revision uh, version of the of the feature film has left, now me and Greg have kind of reversed positions because he really liked it, <laughs> and I thought that it needed a lot of work. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's it's kind of hilarious. Like I was this huge fanboy of the trailer. Like, oh my god, that's the best trailer I've ever seen. Greg, you know, Greg knows I was a Gray State fan. He reads it and he's like, I thought this was a really interesting screenplay, one of the best I've ever read. And then I read it and I'm like. Dude, I thought that it needed a lot of work. Like, I probably wouldn't even invest it, you know. I mean, because stuff like this, I've heard people throw around, you know, like, I wish Mike was still with us because, you know, for some of the stories that we're, from, we're familiar with, Mike is working on a film called Townies. It's an Irish crime kind of film. You know, I, I, th I think it was even, um, oh, what is that? What is that Matt Damon uh, movie uh, with, with uh, Robin Williams? Uh, when he's the, the teacher, uh, Good Will oh, Hunting, right? Yeah. So the Good Will yeah. Hunting, uh, that, that was, I think that was sold for like 600,000 when they first pitched it. So, I mean, for like a Hollywood, a Hollywood screenplay, it's like 50, 60,000, you know, is about like ballpark for, um, 
for, you know, for that kind of offer. So it's just interesting for some guy to, you know, invest 10 K and for them to get like around 60, 65, like, and then some guy was trolling you, Greg saying like, Oh, 30 million. Oh, that's like a Hollywood comedy movie. Like, let's put that into perspective for that dude. Cause he had no idea what he's talking about. Terminator one, as, as Caesar said, guys was like an eight or $900,000 budget. Granted it was the eighties and you know, the blockbuster wasn't a thing yet, blah, blah, blah. blah. But what I'm saying is, Action sci-fis have been made for less than a million dollars. So don't try to come to us and, you know, John Wick, I think I was telling you guys before. It, um, yeah. John Wick had issues around 20, 30 million dollars. Keanu Reeves invested his own money to get it finished. John Wick won. Now, and that, that was that was basically considered like a indie Hollywood f- film for, for their standard. You know what I mean? So when people throw around these 30 million, 60 billions, blah, blah, blah. Um, but... Yeah, it's just, I, Greg, I found it super unfocused. I didn't find, I, the characters, I didn't really have any emotional attachment to any of them. Like, even even the villains, like, I'm like, I don't, like, I gotta, I gotta hate the villains, you know what I mean? Especially in something where we're coming and taking your freedom away. These guys need to be the most, like, heartless of all time. Now, n- not to say well, David couldn't have uh, tightened all this stuff up and got it ready, but it's just like, and I found it super unfocused. Even the, the Native American theme, like, I appreciate the concept of him putting the Lakotas in there, but what I would have liked to have seen, I wish we had Mac with us guys, is the natives are people who are completely exterminated by uh, European colonists. You know what I mean? What I would have liked to have seen is that same fighting spirit that they were fighting for their little literal existence with during colonization against this totalitarian government. I would have liked to have seen that come out. I would have liked to have seen those Lakota uh, rituals to, to add. You know, he writes like, uh, the Lakota performs a Lakota prayer over the body. I, I, I got to see the actual uh, ritual and I got to know the purpose of it because I would have liked to actually seen the Lakota spirit. You know what I mean? That's that was, what was missing from that, that Lakota theme. Like, so I'm not saying he didn't put things in there that I thought were good, but I just didn't see any like extrapolation on it as opposed, as opposed to also, I mean, I know we said we were, we weren't sure what we we're going to do about the spoilers, when the whole revolution gets behind Daniel, like, dude, I gotta, I gotta see a reason for that. It can't just be like, hey, there's one guy out there getting false flagged and he's fighting the revolution by himself. We're all gonna go follow him. Like, I gotta see what he did to win them. You know, it's just like certain cliches, like you were saying. Like, I felt there was just like certain cliches in there that are like dude it's too predictable like you can see that coming from a mile away you, you got to get us emotionally invested and then we got to feel it that's and like i said who knows maybe this is a super early prototype um but i don't necessarily agree that if you just sold it to a bunch of hollywood writers they would have fixed everything right away like that's not what i'm saying i'm saying maybe if david took it to the right people and they gave him the right feedback i think all that stuff would have been tightened up to the point of and maybe for a series if it's like three or four series, you know, that's like 10 episodes each. So maybe you would have seen all that stuff play out over the story okay. arcs, you know what I mean? But um, yeah, I, I thought it needed major work, man. And, you know, maybe I'm just being too critical because we've been waiting 10 years. So so, much, so maybe, I made, maybe I made the standard too high for myself. But like, I was like, the talent that I saw in the concept trailer, I would literally say that as far as filmmaking, I know he was an early filmmaker. I'd literally say David was probably a genius. However, maybe that was more of a directing talent that came across in the concept trailer as opposed to screenwriting. It's literally a completely other, uh, a, a different talent than what directing is. Now, you do have some screenwriter directors in Hollywood, guys like Stanley Kubrick and Ridley Scott, but not always. You got to keep in mind, a lot of those Hollywood directors just, you know, Scarface, for instance, you have somebody else write it for you and then Brian De Palma directs it. You know, you see what I'm saying? So doing both is very, very difficult. I don't expect yeah. some starting out guy to just get in there and knock them both out and amaze us, you know? Correct. So sadly, guys, I got to wrap up. It's 12.35 a.m. for me here now. Okay, so my friend. Well, cool. thank you. We, if you, you know, we can do a, a follow-up show. I know you don't want to cut you off your response to Ross there. I do want to jump on one thing as a nerd, and I noticed it. Um, yeah. So been into martial arts and stuff myself immediately when you said i'm into martial arts movies like see more fights well being as somebody's into all of that and watches all of those kind of movies too um i immediately gravitate to that and thought right i want to ask him about martial arts movies one time your love and passion of them i, I watch a ridiculous 
amount of them. Even that series, uh, the recent series, which I've been talking about all the time on recent shows, uh, Warrior, set in San Francisco in the, I think, the 19th century. We've got all the um, Chinese gangs fight, mm -hmm. fighting with the Irish gangs for control of San Fran. Um, awesome. Um, but yeah, I better shut up or I'll make myself even <laughs> lick. I can talk about that stuff all day. Yeah, well, well, I believe it was Jeet Kune Do, which was the, most, the martial art. Yeah, definitely. The, the Jeet Kune Do was what Danny August Mason studied, which is the Bruce Lee martial art, yeah. as you know, guys, yeah. which is what they were going for uh, for Grace Day, which I think would have been original because you don't see it yeah. a lot on screen. I, I would say that was definitely, obviously, David comes from a military background, so I'd say the whole like, when he described like the military stuff, the Iraq, the Afghanistan, the hand-to-hand the -hand combat, the guns and the weapons, as, as Greg was saying, I think that was what he did best. But as for everything else, which is like the story arcs and the emotion and the diet, I mean, that's what a screenplay is. So you could definitely see what his strengths were. And I think that would have, de you know, if I, if they went to set, David would have been the, 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 uh, the, the military advisor, you know what I mean? Because that's who, you know, make sure everything is accurate on set. Like guys are holding the, you know, weapons correctly and, and all the equipment and everything. So you can see, but I don't know. Yeah, Maybe yeah. I'm wrong. Um, well, I look forward to a to a part two, and we're gonna yeah. we can dive a little bit. Yeah, later. yeah. Let's let's do a post game. If you want to have me and Gaz on, you know, over on the gray stage, we could come over there and do it and do a post game with you. If you want to come, you guys want to come back with us. However, you guys want to. And also, also, Greg, if you just want to come on one time for a, a general discussion on the movies um, and music oh, as well, the well. <laughs> creative process, we, we often get off yeah, topic. Sure. One of our co-hosts, um, Caesar, shout out to Caesar of C Dark Films. Um, we often, well, we do that with everybody. We just look for an excuse, and then we green lit like, yes, <laughs> wait for him to say action movies. Yeah, okay, he said it. Um, yeah, well, that's pretty much it. But. Um, you know, it, it's certainly in, it, it certainly would be an interesting topic, especially um, chatting about indie film now, where it, it seems to be. And again, this would be a debate for all of the show, but with Disney pretty much owning most of the movie industry, and it's getting harder and harder for other properties to get out there now. Um, I did creative writing and screenwriting at school myself. Graduated two years ago, so nice. um, it's something I'm very interested in i do want to send shouts to everybody i know i've missed some folks uh shout out to Catherine, sophia uh steve aka mc therapist alphabetic as yes, well, sir, well. Didn't see it there. mike o'day as well thanks for coming through man um reach out to ross if you want to come on the show as well i know we had you on way back in the day uh of course thanks to dan for joining us and anybody who's listened or listens back in the podcast um very interesting for sure and yeah definitely lots out there so do you just want to um shout out where people can find you on the internet um greg for us just before we, we pop uh, off? real quick one thing before that just a question for the fans and the group okay. so since it looks like gray steak is never happening if someone was was going to do a similar kind of uh project would you guys want to see it that would be uh that'd be a question for the fans and then greg let everybody know where they could find you where where you're greg, get greg your fernandez phone. jr yeah that's it yeah. and uh, also the, is it the gray stage dot wordpress or just Grace correct yeah, okay. the, the gray stage dot wordpress dot com that's right yeah and a gray stage uh youtube channel as well subscribe there get go get greg's book it's uh the hard copies you have the link are on a specific site or and the yeah, free the hard PDF. Yeah, the hard copy is on uh, lulu.com, and I'll make sure that everybody has that. But if you go to the website, follow the link, you'll you'll definitely find it. Greg's enjoying a little red wine. I think I'm going to go to bed and drink myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have a couple things after this. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. You're, I you're really welcome. appreciate your, your your help with this. Thank you so much. No, it, it was overdue, man. I've been I've been working with you guys for like five, six years, and, and I know, right? Do, do, do a, like a weekly show, and you guys do a weekly show. <laughs> and it never occurs to us like, hey, maybe we should do it together. Anyway, st stay tuned for part two. Shout out to Greg <laughs> and Dan. Subscribe, all of us. Follow all of us. Yeah. And uh, yeah, another successful show. Shout out to the fans who came through. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Thanks everybody for supporting it. Um, everyone stay safe at the moment as well. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll get through this and we'll, we'll be okay. And um, just look out for each other and stay safe, y'all. Talk to oh, you yeah, soon. We, we never yeah. got to ask them about COVID-19, but oh, that's we, okay. We, I'm not really, there's been enough about it. I'm not, not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> neither are we. Neither are we. Yeah. Uh, one thing quick, guys. I just want everyone to shout out the channel American Spy Fox. That kid does okay. an awesome 
uh, Nirvana Kurt Cobain series. Um, I'm going to try to get him for an interview as well. I'll send his channel over to Greg and Dan if they oh, want to follow that, that stuff. Yeah, I yeah it's, that. it's really good. Check that out, guys. All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Vision, thanks so. All right. Thanks all. Peace. Respect.